Absolutely brilliant, fantastic video. Okay, am I coming out all right? Okay. Oh, everybody else is muted their mics. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, panelists, please, uh, if you are so inclined, please, uh, you're welcome to turn on your mics and unmute yourselves in case, so long as uh, we do not have any kind of feedback. If we have feedback, we'll have to meet each other. Hello, well, hi everyone. Uh, what a fantastic turnout we have today, my God. Uh, welcome to people on Zoom, people on the YouTube, to the very first All Japan Nerd Night. Uh, I am, my name is uh, Raymond Terhune, uh, one of the Nerd Night Kansai bosses. I will be doing a small MC part in between scenes here today. Uh, first off, fantastic video. Who uh, who made that? Was it was it at you, Andrew? Very beautiful. Yeah. You know, uh, please please send that over to Kansai so we can use that as well in the future. Uh, now. Uh, if people, some people here have been to Nerd Night before, uh, some people this might be the first time. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, Nerd Night, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory in the video we got there. It's, we, it's a group of people who organize, you know, these monthly events of uh, nerdy people with even more nerdier panelists. We come together to share a drink, to commune, and to you know, enjoy and celebrate ner nerdiness and nerd night. Yes, uh, Katie's got the right idea. Yes, and to uh, considering the times that we are in uh, today, we are have, have decided to host uh, nerd night online. And as just so has it, we've been at all of the. Uh, Nerd Nights in Japan have been in touch and we've decided to open up the very first All Japan Nerd Night. Today we are joined by three fantastic panelists hosted by each uh, region, which is Nerd Night Okinawa, Nerd Night Kansai, and Nerd Night Tokyo. That's right, uh, Nerd Night Okinawa people, please like wave at the camera so people can see who you are. Uh, Nerd Night Kansai people here. And uh, Nerd Night Tokyo. Fantastic. So, uh, just the you know kind of a standard operating procedure how things are going to go. Uh, we will each uh, panelist uh, will uh, presenter excuse me will speak for uh, roughly twenty minutes. It will be timed, and then they will be given ten minutes of a Q and A session. Uh, Speakers will be warned, will be given a slight warning, perhaps like two, maybe a two minute warning. 
but we trust that everybody will be timing themselves at home. And then during the Q&A, we will be taking questions from the Zoom chat and the YouTube as well. Now, in order to do that, uh, the participants within Zoom, you have a, you have a chat function and a Q&A section. Uh, we will be looking at both, but please, you know, we recommend perhaps using the uh, chat section, make sure that all panelists can see it, and type in hand up. And once you see that, uh, we will cue that person, and then we will actually promote you into a panelist role where you will be able to ask your question verbally. Of course, if you do not want to show your face or have your voice heard on the screen, then you are welcome to type it in the chat. Once we take a few questions from the YouTube, then uh, from, excuse me, from the Zoom, we will take some questions from the YouTube chat. So uh, please feel free. There is a slight delay between the uh, Zoom chat and the uh, YouTube chat. So people on the YouTube, please um, just you know, type it yeah, as soon as you can. And since we can't take your calls uh, up through audio, just uh, type it in as fast as you can. OK, so we have still a couple more minutes until our first uh, speaker is going to come up, who will be introduced by the Nerd Night Okinawa team. So I think uh, at this point in time, we uh, I am happy to set, hand this off to uh, Maggie to, of Nerd Night Okinawa so that you can explain uh, your part to it and you know give us the spiel of the nerds of Okinawa. All right, great. Thank you so much, Raymond, for getting us started. Um, the first speaker for the first All Nerd Night Japan uh, Nerd Night is going to be from Okinawa. Um, his name is Otis Brunner. He is a PhD candidate in the Marine Biophysics Unit at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. He um, is pretty obsessed with hydrothermal vents, um, which he will talk about today, but um, as somebody that sits behind him in the lab, I can tell you that this is the person that is most nerdy about, about hydrothermal vents of any human being that I have ever met in my entire life. And I've been a marine scientist for 10 years and I've met a lot of people that are into hydrothermal vents, but nobody as much as Otis. So you can have a very, um, very well-informed person to tell you about this this evening. Um, so, Otis originally comes from the UK. Um, he did his undergraduate degree at Plymouth University. Um, he came to Okinawa a couple of years ago, originally with his wife, and then he got sucked into um, starting his PhD at OIST, and now he's stuck sitting behind me. So um, I don't have so much more to say about Otis. I think, he, I think you'll get a lot of information just from seeing him talk and see how excited he is about his research topic. Um, so I won't wait much longer. I'll just hand it over, hand it over to Otis. Thanks, Maggie. That was such a lovely introduction and so brutally honest. Um, yeah, I'll try and be as informative as I can. I will certainly be as nerdy as I can. I'll try not to be too excited, otherwise I might, you know, run through this presentation too quickly. Um, but without further ado, I'll try and share the screen successfully and We'll move on from there. So um, as Maggie mentioned, I'm a complete nerd about hydrothermal vents, but actually before I was a nerd about hydrothermal vents, I was a nerd about conservation in general. So I wanted to share my nerdiness of conservation with you, but specifically about hydrothermal vents and um, mining of the deep sea, what I call a literal race to the bottom. So um, to give you a little bit more background to myself, some of it Maggie covered, but right now, uh, as Maggie said, I'm a student at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Okinawa, Japan. Um, but previously I was living and working in the UK and working on deep sea conservation, um, not of hydrothermal vents. And um, when you think of ocean conservation, you might, or you probably do think of coral reefs. Well, actually in the UK, this is one of the ecosystems in the deep sea that I was working to conserve. 
in the UK, we actually do have coral reefs, not like the ones we have in Okinawa. These are cold water coral reefs that live at the deep dark depths of the ocean beyond the reach of sunlight. So um, actually survive off of the food that they find in the ocean, like small animals. So more predatory coral reefs and don't rely on photosynthesis whatsoever. Back then, my, um, my task was a little bit more straightforward than it is now. Um, because I would take what we know about the biology of corals and then use that to predict where they would live, as is depicted on this uh, map on the right by the red spots. I'd then show a map like this to, um, to stakeholders such as fishermen who would generally avoid fishing in these areas because um, if they did fish over these coral reefs, they're likely to get their very expensive gear tangled up in the coral reefs which they're not interested in. And we really don't want them to destroy these, uh, these rare um, creatures and vulnerable ecosystems. However, as I said, now I'm in Okinawa, Japan, and I'm not working on coral reefs. I'm working on hydrothermal vents um, as is symbolized by this um, paper model that I made of hydrothermal vents, which in part contributed to Maggie's accusation of nerdiness. Um, <laughs> Right now, my, um, the task is a little less straightforward than it used to be because um, industry, unfortunately, has a vested interest in destroying hydrothermal vents, um, while very few industries have a vested interest in destroying coral reefs. But uh, we'll move on to that a little bit more later. Um, it's, it's a good idea now to talk about what hydrothermal vents are. It's, it's helpful to think of hydrothermal vents as sort of underwater volcanoes as they occur where the Earth's crust is heated up at tectonic plate boundaries. But instead of magma spewing from a mountain as, they, as volcanoes do in the terrestrial ecosystem, um, hydrothermal vents are sites of superheated seawater spews, spewing from these chimney structures. So what is it about these geological features that conservationists like myself find so interesting and industry also find so interesting? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to that enlightened period of science, the late 1970s, when a group of marine geologists from the US correctly predicted the existence of hydrothermal vents. So in 1977, they geared up in their small shorts and fins and prepared on an expedition to the Galapagos to confirm their hypothesis that hydrothermal vents do exist at tectonic boundaries. They did confirm this, the existence in 1977, but what they didn't expect to find was the abundance of life that actually exists at hydrothermal vents. They had rightly predicted that hydrothermal vents would be the site of superheated chemical rich seawater spewing from chimneys. Because of this, they assumed that there would be no life able to exist there. Actually, so unprepared were they to discover life at hydrothermal vents that they didn't have the supplies to preserve the biological specimens they brought on board. I mean, they were just geologists. So actually they resorted to their own personal supplies of vodka in order to preserve them. As someone who's been on these such long open ocean expeditions before, I can tell you that this really was quite a sacrifice to make for science. So we really thank these brave scientists. Um, a little bit more history about the deep sea in general. For that, we have to go back another hundred years to the expedition of HMS Challenger, which circumnavigated the globe um, focusing on the study of the open ocean and the deep ocean. And when I talk about the deep ocean, I generally mean stuff below roughly 200 meters, um, beyond the continental shelf, and generally beyond the reach of sunlight. Before this expedition, people, the general assumption was that life couldn't exist in the deep open ocean because the sunlight couldn't reach there. And as we all know, sunlight is the basis for, is the energy source for all life on earth. Among the many discoveries they made, they discovered the existence of resource deposits called polymetallic nodules around the globe. I'm now bringing up polymetallic nodules because the, this resource is the number one targeted resource for deep sea mining in the ocean right now. But other than just a resource, they're also a habitat. They're a habitat for lots of weird and wonderful deep sea creatures that we've only known existed for the last 100 or 200 years or so. These, um, these creatures I show you here are a selection of anemones, sponges, and corals. And these use uh, manganese, I mean, polymetallic nodules as a habitat. 
This is one of three resources in the deep ocean that are targeted for mining today. The second being seafloor massive sulfides, or as I like to call them, hydrothermal vents. As I mentioned, hydrothermal vents are a uh, site of abundant life in the deep ocean. Actually, many scientists refer to them as oases in the deep ocean. As I mentioned before, humans couldn't exist um, life, couldn't uh, imagine the existence of life beyond the reach of sunlight, but found in the deep ocean that the um, products of sunlight, the plankton that are in the surface, do reach the deep ocean and support it. However, hydrothermal vents stand apart because these ecosystems in no way depend on photosynthesis. Actually, the energy source for this ecosystem is the chemicals spewing from the hydrothermal vent in a process called chemosynthesis. And you can start to see why I'm particularly nerdy about this system and why I talk, focus most of this talk on this deep sea ecosystem. Thirdly and finally, we have cobalt crusts. These resources occur on the steep edges of underwater mountains. Um, yeah, we do have underwater mountains, by the way. Some of them are even larger than Mount Everest. What else um, occurs on the edge of these steep underwater mountains? Well, actually, it's cold water coral reefs. Um, they also exist here. And the point I'm trying to get to is that these three major resources aren't simply resources. They're actually habitats for a variety of life in the deep sea that defies all expectations. So what happens when we introduce these habitats to human industry and people in high-vis vests? Well, as you can see from this image showing three different types of deep sea mining um, vehicles, deep sea mining is not science fiction. In fact, it's due to happen very soon. Most likely in this decade, and in some cases even this year. So now we know what is going to be mined and when, you probably are wondering where. Well, the short answer to that is everywhere. This is a map of all the mining licenses given over to countries in international waters. We have cobalt crusts um, targeted a lot in the Northwest Pacific around where I'm calling in from today. Polymetallic nodules, a lot of them occurring in the Eastern Central Pacific and seafloor massive sulfides or hydrothermal vents, which are largely targeted in the Indian Ocean. I should point out at this point, however, this, this is only a map of the mining intentions in international waters. Those are waters beyond the national jurisdiction of any country. So who has ownership, who has rights, and who has responsibilities for these waters that are beyond any other country's reach? Well, the simple answer to that is all of us. These are the shared resource and right of all mankind, and no one country has a stronger claim over them than any other. No one person has a stronger claim over these resources or these habitats than any other person. So what about here in Okinawa? Why did I come all the way from the UK to Okinawa to study hydrothermal vents? Well, as you may have spotted in the first picture, Okinawa in Japan is rich in hydrothermal vents. And as you can see from this report by the Japan Times that came out in 2017, when deep sea mining was trialed right here in Okinawa, um, there are intentions to mine hydrothermal vents right here in Okinawa this year. It's quoted mid 2020, which if I'm not mistaken is pretty much now. So to keep track of such mining activities, I visit the Deep Sea Mining Watch website, which uses publicly available information on the, on the um, movement of deep sea mining capable vessels. Here, for example, is the tracking of one such vessel in 2017, the one that was mentioned in the article, and its trip to the Izena Hole, which right near Okinawa, as you can see here, is due to be the fir world's first hydrothermal vent to be fully mined. So why mine hydrothermal vents? Well, as a lot of you may know, Japan is particularly poor in certain primary resources and hydrothermal vents provide a source of gold, silver, copper, zinc, and other rare earth minerals, rare earth minerals that are useful in smartphones and green technology. Nautilus Minerals, um, uh, a deep sea mining company has created this image that I've used as the background and as they show, these resources are simply sitting on the surface of the seafloor. Unlike these resources 
in the terrestrial ecosystem where they will be where you'd have to mine deep into um, mountains or along veins of mineral deposits they're just sitting there ready to be taken or as the mining industries will tell you what is left out from this image is the abundance of life that exists on and around hydrothermal vents again this image is from deep sea mining watch as you can see from this uh, image this mock-up these mine giant mining vessels turn the surface of hydrothermal vents and all the creatures that make it its home into a liquid mush, which is then pumped to a support vessel at the surface. Not only does this destroy the unique organisms that rely on hydrothermal vents in the most horrific manner, it also um, creates intense noise and toxic plumes that can do serious damage to surrounding marine ecosystems. So what do we lose when we destroy hydrothermal vents in this way? Well, in the last 43 years, um, a lot of discoveries have been made, but the short answer is that we don't really know what we've lost when it, um, before it's gone because these ecosystems are so remote and so strange to us that we've hardly scratched the surface in terms of discoveries. But in the short time that we've known about them, we have made some really interesting and significant discoveries for all mankind, namely um, the origin of life. Hydrothermal vents are a very strong candidate for the origin of life on Earth. Also, their reliance on chemosynthesis and independence from sunlight makes them uh, pos makes, uh, makes other um, celestial bodies in our solar system possible candidates for life, such as the frozen moons of Jupiter that may hold hydrothermal vents deep below the frozen um, oceans that could support life. But if we bring it a little bit back to Earth, to here and now, the unique biology of the organisms that can survive at hydrothermal vents provide a, a wealth of potential medical advances. One quite strong example is an enzyme that exists within um, a bacteria that lives and thrives at hydrothermal vents is currently used for medical testing of COVID-19. So this is just one example of the medical advancements that are made when you keep such a strange and unique ecosystem intact. Because of this, because of these and many other reasons, there is actually a global resistance to deep sea mining in general. Most notably this year, the good old Sir David Attenborough um, said that the rush to mine these pristine and unexplored environments risks creating terrible impacts that cannot be reversed. We need to be guided by science when faced with decisions of such great environmental consequences. This quote was a foreword to a report by Fauna and Flora International, which called for an international ban on hydrothermal vent mining. This came only one year or less than one year after Pacific Island nations joined together to call for a 10 year ban on any deep sea mining. Including this call was Papua New Guinea, which is significant because they were due to host the world's first international deep sea mining company, Nautilus Minerals Incorporated. I say um, host because this was a Canadian based company. And I say due to because since then, Nautilus Minerals has gone bust. You may think that the collapse of the mine, collapse of certain mining companies has slowed down the mining industry, the deep sea mining industry, sorry. But in this report entitled Why the Rush, they um, examine uh, the crash of Nautilus Minerals and the rise of a new deep sea mining company also from Canada called Deep Green. And they see that most of those from Nautilus Minerals simply jump ship to deep green. So it hasn't really slowed the progress of deep sea mining. Another focus of this report was the association and influence that these mining companies have, such as Deep Green, on the International Seabed Authority. This is the arm of the United Nations that is responsible for managing um, the international seabed, the seabed beyond national jurisdiction, as I mentioned earlier. They say that these mining companies are having an unfair amount of influence on the International Seabed Authority, which is why they chose a picture of the Secretary General of the ISA posing for a photo shoot with Deep Green as their front cover. So let's talk about why there's such a rush. Well, Deep Green, as well as other uh, mining and deep sea mining industries, claim that it's due to that the resources from the deep sea can support um, drastic growth in green energy 
uh, sorry, green uh, technology, such as renewable energy and electric vehicles. However, there are some cynical, uh, more cynical reasons brought up by these reports. Um, and if you look at the global distribution of all the hydrothermal vents indicated by these red and white triangles on this map, and if, you were to, if we were able to harvest all of the resources from all of the hydrothermal vents currently known in the world, those resources would not even satiate uh, mankind's demand for them for even one year. So they're not as valuable as we may, we may be made for, to think. Also, it's, it's, it's possible, and maybe again cynical, that these deep sea mining companies are rushing to carry out their mining operations before scientific discoveries are made, because the more we know about these ecosystems, the more likely we are to, um, to incorporate uh, protective methods to stop and inhibit deep sea mining operations. So it might, may make deep sea mining more expensive and more difficult. Also, those companies that are um, leading the way in deep sea mining are actually gaining hundreds of millions of dollars in um, speculative capital before they even carry out any mining whatsoever. This speculative capital comes from uh, national governments as well as international companies, um, international defense and military companies. Which leads me to my third and most speculative point. Um, I should mention that these two previous points were within uh, the What's the Rush report, but this is purely of my own opinion. Um, I believe that countries are rushing to set up offshore bases for their mining um, infrastructure. These bases could include monitoring devices as well as military equipment to protect their interests. Um, I believe that, uh, oh, sorry. And if you believe that countries rushing to claim um, land or parts of the sea is uh, a bit paranoid, maybe um, indicative of tinfoil hat that I might be wearing, take a look at this map of national jurisdictions pre-1945 and then compare it to a map of the national jurisdictions today. In summary, I think that nations and companies are rushing to mine the deep sea not because it's beneficial or profitable for all mankind, but simply because they don't wanna be left behind in this race to the bottom. So that's a lot of doom and gloom, um, but what can we do about this? What can we as citizens do about this? Well, a typical problem for conservation, specifically marine conservation, and even more specifically for deep sea conservation, is that these ecosystems are out of sight, so out of mind for most of the public. A solution to that, and also a solution to the fact that I haven't shown you a lot of pretty pictures in this presentation, is simply to take a look at what we have in the deep sea. The weird and wonderful creatures that live there that defy all expectations through the years. Familiarize yourself with these creatures and familiarize your friends with these creatures and you will learn to love and care about them, no matter how weird and unconventionally beautiful they are. Also, more practically, if you're in Okinawa, you should go to Godak. It's a free museum dedicated to ocean science and deep sea science as well, um, held by, uh, run by JAMSTEC, the National Marine Science Institute. Also, if you're not lucky enough to be living in Okinawa, there's the sister institute, the um, Earth Science Museum in Okina um, Yokohama, sorry. If you're not lucky enough to be anywhere in Japan, you can visit the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative website, which has lots of resources um, on the deep sea and conservation, including last year, the publication of a children's book about hydrothermal vents and conservation. And this year, the tra Japanese translation to the same children's book. Thank you all for listening. Um, this talk may seem a little short, but hopefully there's plenty of time for questions. I wanna give a massive thank you to all the Nerd Night organizers, particularly of course, the Okinawa Nerd Night organizers and also the Eco Club at OIST who really inspired um, and built upon my love for conservation. And if you, oh, Eco Club at OIST. And if you want any more um, information on the actual research I do, I should point out that this is, this is my interest, my nerdiness, but not necessarily my research. 
um, you can visit our website, the Marine Biophysics Unit, our lab's website at OIST, or hit me up or at Seven Seas of Science. Also, if you're interested in conservation outside of hydrothermal vents in the deep sea, it, I just found out today that there's the Global Biodiversity Festival going on. It, start, it starts around about now. It's not convenient for those of us in Japan, but it's, it's being live. There's lots of seminars, it should be very interesting. Um, I'll move on to uh, questions now with the help of the panelists. But um, I will. I promise to somehow buy a beer to anyone who can figure out what my research is specifically based on this video. Those of you that already know what my research is elsewhere, you don't get any beer for for calling it out. <laughs> okay, that that's me, and thank you all for listening. Awesome, Otis. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody is able to ask questions that wants to ask questions. So I'm just gonna review the ways that you can ask questions. Um, so on the bottom of your screen, your webinar screen, there's a little handprint. So if you wanna raise your hand to actually speak your question, um, you can press that little handprint and I'll get an alert that there's someone raising their hand and then I'll promote you to panelist so that your video and your, um, your microphone turn on so you can ask Otis your question verbally. Um, if you don't have a microphone or a um, video or you just don't want to talk, that's totally fine too. Um, if that's the case, then you can type your question into the chat and I will read your question to Otis and then he can answer it verbally. Um, so after we do a little bit of um, question and answer here, um, we will also um, pay attention to the um, chat on the YouTube and try to answer some questions there also. Um, so we're looking in lots of places. If we don't get to you right away, I'm sorry, and we will do our absolute best, um, but we will open the floor now for questions um, to Otis. Um, let me just see what we have going on here. In the question and answer area, um, we have a written question and it says, hi, I might have missed this point, but what organization governing body grants the mining rights to these countries wishing to start? Right. I did briefly mention that and there's a lot more detail to go into, but it's called the International Seabed Authority or the ISA for short. It's an arm of the United Nations based in Kingston, Jamaica, that, yeah, that is basically in charge of granting these mining rights and um, sort of maintaining the industry and keeping the industry in check. It's the regulatory body, yeah. Um, I don't have any hands yet, but I still do have some more written questions. Um, so from YouTube, we have um, a, pretty, a pretty broad theoretical question. Okay. Um, what is the connection between deep sea ecosystems and the wider marine ecosystem? That's, that's a really great question. So um, I, I very briefly touched upon it, but um, the challenge around yeah, the late 1800s, bef um, before we knew anything about the deep sea, um, we thought that the uh, life in the deep sea couldn't exist because it's beyond the reach of sunlight, the primary energy source for all life on earth. However, those creatures that live at the surface, once they die, you know, they. They, they, their primary energy source is the sun um, from phytoplankton, small microscopic plants, all the way up to whales. Their primary energy source is the sun. And once they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and the deep sea is supported by that sinking of biological material. The deep sea is full of bottom feeders effectively, except for hydrothermal vents and other similar chemosynthetic ecosystems that get their energy directly from the Earth's crust. Um, uh, oh, great. So I actually, all right, this is hard because I had a good next question um, and we have a hand up. So first, three independent people asked the same question. Okay, yeah. Um, is there any way that mining can be done that won't destroy the ecosystem? Um, yes. I guess the short answer is yes. Um, destroying the ecosystem is a very sort of final term. The, you could, there, are, there are many vents in the sea, some of them are close together. So you could potentially mine one vent without destroy, destroying the whole ecosystem. Um, the thing is, 
you don't know, we don't know currently know exactly how much we lose when you even mine a small part of a vent. Because these species are so adapted to this environment and they're so isolated from each other, often just mining one hydrothermal vent, you'll lose many species, regardless of which hydrothermal vent you mine. There are ways to mitigate the impacts for sure. And that's what um, these calls for banning deep sea mining for the, for the short term are actually focused upon. Not banning it forever, but banning it until we know how to mitigate these damages. So we can mine the deep sea without destroying these ecosystems and doing minimal damage. It's definitely possible. And that's what I, that's what I believe and that's what I work towards. I'm going to let Ryan ask his question. So Ryan, I'm going to promote you to panelist right now. And then you should be able to ask your own question. Um, Ryan Zadarsky, go ahead. I think he may need to unmute his microphone. I think I did. Yeah. Um, I don't see him here as a panelist anymore. I didn't see a Ryan panelist. Cold feet, I guess. All right, well, I will, I will read um, another question while um, we figure out what happened to Ryan, where he went in the ether. Um, um, <laughs> this is funny. Um, so uh, somebody from YouTube recently watched a movie which was criminally overlooked by the Oscars called yeah. Underwater, starring Kristen Stewart, which I also believe is a fabulous actress. And um, they want to know if you've seen this movie, and if so, what is your opinion? I haven't seen that movie. Um, can, can someone tell me what it's about and how long ago it came out? I haven't seen it either. I don't know no? the answer. Well, clearly overlooked by more than just the Oscars. Yeah. Uh, if I'm that... sorry. I, yeah, I, I thought when you started uh, teeing up that question, I'm sure, I was sure you were going to ask me about the Meg. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I have unfortunately seen. Um, but yes, yeah, so I can't answer. I, I don't know anything about that movie, sorry. Okay. Oh, wait, what's the movie called again? I'll, I'll add it to a list. I've got, I've got to watch it. Underwater. Okay. Yeah. I'll yeah. watch it. And, um, Maybe the, um, the questioner can add the, uh, the link for us. <laughs> um, I saw Ryan come in and out a couple times. I saw his video turn on and off. Um, if he is there now, um, maybe he can ask his question. See, I see you connecting all to audio. I see that he exists. Good start for anyone. <laughs> all right, Ryan. All right, yeah. um, another question. Um, this one's easy. Um, can you put the name of the children's book back up? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, uh, treasures of the deep what is treasures of the deep yeah and um, I did I did skim through a lot of these slides and I'm hoping that people will go back to the YouTube recording and look over it as well I even um, accidentally went on to the bibliography like the reference list for this uh, um, so also look at that because I've referenced a lot of people's materials it's all in there but treasures of the deep it's freely available as PDF on this website. You don't have to pay for it. It's open to everyone. It's beautiful and interesting. And I've tried to read it to children um, multiple times, but maybe the wrong age. I think they have to be a little older than I've aimed for. I have another question to read to you. This one's from Notori San. Um, she says, in your opinion, um, which is more harmful to our environment, land mining or deep sea mining? Or would you say both? And how do we balance economic activities and environmental conservation? And by the way, great talk, Otis. Oh, I miss you, Notori san. Um, that's an excellent question. And I think the key she's hit on there is the balance. There, there is a way to balance it. And we need to find that to, to balance. It, it's called sustainable um, development. And um, I don't know about which one is more damaging. Uh, the land takes up a larger area. If you were to try and mine these resources from say 
um, a vein in a mountainside, you would have to take a lot of land away. However, arguably, the life living in that land area could migrate elsewhere or still survive elsewhere. However, when you, even though you only mine a small area of the deep sea to mine hydrothermal vents, the organisms that live there may not be able to survive anywhere else. So it depends on how, on what you value. Um, aesthetically, uh, so a land mine will look horrible, but at the deep sea, you don't see it. So if you value seeing nature, maybe it's not as important, but if you value extinction, for example, if you value avoiding extinction, deep sea mining is very tricky. Um, there's a very, it's a very difficult question to answer. There's lots of nuance to it. It's, it's an excellent question. And I recommend visiting the DOSI website for real answers. <laughs> Otis, I want to know what is your favorite deep sea creature and why? And also uh, great, great nerding out, Otis. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it is, it's not actually a hydrothermal vent creature, sorry. Um, it's a chimera. It's a close relative to sharks. Some Sometimes they're called like ghost fish. They, or they rat sort of, fish, right? And sometimes rat fish. Yeah, it depends who you talk to, I guess. I would call them ghost fish because I like them, but I guess some people would call them rat fish. Um, <laughs> they sort of glide. They're, they're smaller, slender, and long, long tails. And they glide above the seabed. Um, also, they have a venomous spine in front of their fin and just behind the genitals that are actually on their head. So they're really weird and they're sharks. So that's both of my tick boxes right there. So we have we have actually a pretty interesting question that I've, I've never thought about this this way before. Um, so from YouTube, um, deep water formation keeps the deep ocean cold and oxidized to so like the, the conveyor belt, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Which increases the redox and temperature gradients at vents, which fuels life. So is it strictly true that life there is not dependent on photosynthesis or the, or the sun? Ah, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, um, well, not, hmm. I mean, yeah, oxygen levels are really important at hydrothermal vents and that's sort of what links it to the rest of the world for sure. So is it completely independent of photosynthesis? <laughs> because without photosynthesis, you wouldn't have the oxygen levels in the globe potentially to support life at hydrothermal vents. Wow, I think you've really got me there. I, I think the only question that that question should be posed to an astrobiologist who is, pe some people are currently looking into the potential of life on Europa, these frozen moons of Jupiter. So if life could exist there, then I would say yes, independent of photosynthesis. That, I don't actually know the answer to that. That's really, yeah, whoever you are, you didn't need to tune into my talk. You already know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, okay, I have one more question here. Um, still no hands. Nobody wants to talk, I guess. Um, right, is Ryan still around? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, he's still promoted to a panelist, but I think that he doesn't know it. Um, maybe he tuned out to go get a drink or something. Um, so, from Alexis in Okinawa, we have, thank you for your presentation. When organisms are taken from the deep sea, do they deal with pressure changes or, with, or risks as they come up to the surface pressure? Yes, they, some, some organisms for sure. For example, uh, fish and deep sea fish have swim bladders, so sort of air filled sacs to keep their buoyancy. And as you decrease the pressure, as you take them out of the deep sea, yeah, those air sacs will rupture, they'll die, they'll become a, a mess. Um, in fact, you've probably seen images of the blobfish, you know, this thing that looks like a sad, fat middle-aged man. It's, it doesn't actually look like that in the deep sea. It's been completely messed up by the pressure change. However, um, some, uh, some arthropods, some, um, some isopods and things like that, uh, which are quite indicative of the deep sea, some crustaceans can survive the pressure change if it's slow enough. But um, no, it'll mess, it'll mess these creatures up. So um, scientific expeditions, when we capture them, yeah, we, we capture a lot of dead organisms. And, but that's by design. We capture a few dead organisms, preserve them and study them. So sampling the deep sea is, is sometimes a little bit dark. 
Oh, Ryan, I heard you cough. That's you. You can't avoid us now. You I heard me? me? Yeah, we hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Did you want to ask I'm a question? Sure. Yeah, I'm just trying to like wrap my wrap, my my, uh, my mind around this right now. Um, so like the deep sea mining is what you guys are talking about. So like what what is actually like entailed about it? Like do they actually like destroy the um the vents or what? So the um we have deep sea mining of vents and I should mention I know I do focus on vents, but there are also mining of other but with mining of vents they're interested in the what's called seafloor massive sulfides, the deposits that come out of the Earth's crust and build these chimneys. Uh, these chimneys contain the resources. So it is, the as you can see in the slide from this children's book, it is the chimneys themselves that they mine. Um, they target non-active hydrothermal vents um, and the chimney structures there. But it's the chimney structures and the surrounding um, hard sediment that they target, the stuff that's precipitated from this super hot chemical rich seawater. They turn that into a mush and then pump it to the ship and then refine it. Um, other panelists, how are we doing on time? Can we ask, answer more questions or are we running out of time? Uh, we're a bit about five minutes over the uh, allotted 10 minutes. All right, well, well we have questions. a couple more questions in, um, in YouTube and um, on, on the chat. So I'm gonna um, send them to Otis in chat so that he can just write the answers. And um, so that way everyone gets their question answered and, um, and we stay on schedule. So we are going to take um, a break now so that everybody has time to make their drinks, go to the bathroom, and then we will come back with the next speaker from Nerd Night Kansai. Great, I'll try and answer as many as I can. Fair warning, I'll be getting more and more drunk as the evening goes, so they may get less coherent.
hey, hey, hey. This is your friendly neighborhood nerd night co-boss, Andrew. This is your two-minute warning. That's that's what I'm doing. It's your two-minute warning. So if you haven't got your drink already, now's the time. Run and get it. Be back in your seat, and we're going to start again in two minutes. Hi, nerds. Uh, this is Andrew, one of the Nerd Night Tokyo co-bosses. I'm just invading your ear holes right now to tell you about my theater company, the Oklahoma Theater Group, also known as YTG. YTG is a registered nonprofit in Japan, and we create theatrical events. Our work is multilingual, multinational, and uh, somewhat experimental, and I think we're pretty unique in Japan. Uh, you may or may not know that Nerd Night Tokyo functions as a critical fundraiser for YTG that we've come to rely on to cover the overhead costs of keeping the company running. So I'm here to ask you to support us, if you can, by either buying a virtual ticket to tonight's show or by donating directly to YTG itself. You can do either of these two things by heading over to ytg.jp and clicking on the little pop-up that's going to come up there or by going to the support page link in the menu. And look, I know that some of you, like me, are freelancers and some of you may have lost your jobs. So if you're not able to support us right now, please do not feel obliged. If you're in a tight financial spot or otherwise you're not able or inclined to donate, please just enjoy the show with no reservations. We are happy to have you here. Okay, um, that's enough for me. Just a reminder, the place where you can go to uh, support YTG is ytg.jp. Okay, on with the show. Okay, fantastic. Great, uh, great first, great first talk, great first talk. I hope uh, we can, Nerdnight Kansai can be, can uh, deliver just as well. And I, I know we can. Uh, so now, now uh, it's, we're passing on the ball to going slightly up north, all the way up to the wonderful land of Kansai. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Raymond Jerhune, uh one of the co-bosses. And yeah, then Katie. Okay. Uh, my name is Katie. I'm co-organizer. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I'm just going to pop this uh, screen just a little bit just to introduce ourselves. Uh, so here uh, we are, uh, Nerd Night Kansai. Here's a little schedule that we got going here. We're second up. Uh, yeah, so we're one of the you know younger Nerd Night Kansais. Uh, sorry, Nerd Nights. Over here in Kansai, we like everybody. We hold our events once a month. There's a, a event that we held, uh, bef you know, when everybody could get together and lick each other's faces before the dark times. Uh, there's you can see there's me and there's Katie, and you can see right over the back here there's Amanda, the boss for Nerd Night Tokyo. She was kind enough to join us on that day. The uh, so yeah. Uh, this is good. This is our fourteenth one that we've kind of done, and we're happy to. I'm super excited to be part of, uh, you know, this growing group of Jap uh, Japan Nerd Night fans. Uh, and so I guess we don't have much to say or plug, but we'd like to. Uh, I'd like to hand this over to Katie to kind of plug our pluggables that we have. Yeah. So as you can see on this slide, you know, we have our two locations where we host Nerd Night. When we're in Osaka, we do it at Lingua World Cafe, and when we're in Kyoto we go to Urban Guild uh, and they're both and Gojo Guest House also now in Kyoto and they're all fantastic places and obviously you know at this time lots of local businesses are having lots of you know lots of troubles so if you can you know support your local businesses if you live in Osaka or Kyoto we really recommend I think both these places are doing takeout right now or maybe now that shops are starting to open again you could go get a coffee or something that would be great. And on top of that, we've also, uh, we work sometimes with TEL, which is actually a nationwide charity in Japan, which helps 
the English speaking community with like mental health support. So they do like counseling sessions and lots of information. And obviously they're also, you know, need some support right now. So if there's any way you would like to donate or go buy a coffee or just do something to support our community, that would be really appreciated. So thank you everyone. Yeah, uh, and for more information about us, uh, you know, we have our Facebook, we have our Twitter. If you're in the Kansai area, you're always welcome to join us, you know, keep and or shoot us a question. And, you know, for without any further ado, we'd uh, like to pass this, uh, pass this on to our presenter for the evening, the much excited, although uh, self-proclaimed boring girl, uh, Chrissy Shears Ozeki. So I'm going to stop my screen here. And uh, Chrissy, when you're ready, please go ahead and uh, mute yourself, share your, and share your screen so you can. And I'll start uh, the timer when you just begin. As uh, as she's getting ready, uh, I'm going just to remind you: if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, uh, please feel free to chat uh, to write your questions in the chat or click the hand up button so that we can allow you to speak so you can ask your question vocally. We are also keeping an eye on the YouTube questions. Okay, Chrissy, are you ready? Uh, sorry, I'm just having a problem sharing the screen. I'm trying to see. I can't see it on my screen. We oh, can wait. see. Uh, we can see your screen right now. Yeah. Oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, there I am. I'm not quite sure why. Is it, oh, is it like that? Right. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Now we now it's full screen. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Uh, okay, so I'm Christine Shiazazeki, and uh, yeah, I'm self-proclaimed boring girl because of my research, which I'll explain later. Um, I'm a PhD student at Kyoto University, and I'm going to talk to you about solving mysteries from traces of ancient life. Okay, so there's T-Rex looking for clues. So what is paleontology? And uh, you know, it isn't, what is it and what isn't it? It isn't archeology, span which a lot of people think it is. Um, archeology span is the study of human interaction in the past. And paleontology is the study of ancient life from anything up to the Holocene. And you can see the Holocene on the geological, the fun geological map. That's not that accurate, um, but it, I just put it on because it's fun. Um, and uh, you can see some of the organisms on the side here, sort of just telling you what they are. So, okay, so, and also, uh, what does it include? It includes things like studying trace marks, which I'll talk about later, um, past environments, past ecologies, past diets, diseases, and uh, past behaviors of organisms. So, a brief, I'll give you a brief explanation of fossilization for those people that aren't sure or they don't remember. So obviously an organism dies and then it decays and it gets covered in sediment and eventually some of that erodes away and you get this fossil. So that's very, very brief. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So where do I come in? And I, my study is on things called trace marks and uh, trace marks are also known as ethnology which um and you can see trace marks today in modern day and there's two types of ethnology so you've got neo-ethnology which is modern traces and paleoethnology which is fossil traces and there these are um remains of organisms um they're not the bones and they can tell us things like the behavior the diet the environment, the ecosystems, and what's happened to an organism after it dies. So uh, this is just some examples of modern day ethnology. So you know, it's a modern day trace mark. So you've got a bird footprint here in the sand. And these are some 12th century chess, mark, uh, chess pieces from uh, uh, somewhere in Scotland called, the, they're famous, 
Lewis chess pieces. And if you look carefully on the face of them, you can see these like, they look like scratches, but they're what we call surface etchings. And they're from fungal erosion, but by the fungal acids. Okay, so, and, and here's some other organisms that, uh, some other things that cause traces or marks of traces. So we have this whalebone here with these, uh, what they uh, kind of popular term is zombie worms, but actually they're ozidacs and they feed on the whale bones. And these boring marks here are um, from sponges on this shell. And some more borings here um, from bivalves. So this is a famous uh, bivalve that uh, bores into wood and creates a lot of damage on old ships and things and uh, was famous for creating damage on the Armada ships during the Spanish War. And, um, and here's some more boring uh, bivalves that bore into rock and some more rock bivalves. Sorry. And then uh, this is a piece of wood that has been bored by mayfly larvae. So that, and, and so what do we know about, we, we look at these modern day examples because they help us identify things that happened in the past. So we, here's some fossil trace marks. So trace marks are not just borings. Okay, so we have a, a bite mark here on a piece of bone. Actually, this bone is very big because it's a fragment from a sauropod uh, hip area, a pelvic bone. And, uh, and this, this uh, bite mark is about 10 centimeters long. And we have a coprolite, which is uh, fossilized poop. And these are most likely from what we call a theropod dinosaur. And uh, these, these bones were actually, uh, sorry, these, these fossils are from Morocco. And uh, this, this uh, dinosaur here is uh, from the same area. And so as more trace marks here, you can have trace marks in the form of footprints. You can have crawling, uh, crawling, but, uh, oh my goodness, crawling <laughs> traces. Uh, this is from a trilobite, and, and sometimes we're lucky because uh, trace marks often don't have the body fossil of the organism that created it, but this crawling trace here does have the body fossil, and that's uh, an arthropod, which is like a trilobite. Uh, and Okay, and so we have some more uh, traces. Uh, this one is uh, bore, uh, burrows from worms. And these again are surface etchings on bone, um, most likely from fungus. So, uh, but sometimes we don't know what these, as I said, we don't know what these traces are from. And so we need to be detectives to find them out. So we, we're not 100% sure this is fungal traces. It could be very small termites, but it, it resembles the traces that were seen on the Lewis Chessman and other traces that other people have uh, identified on things from fungal, uh, from fungi as well. And, and again, with the burrows, we don't always know that they're from worms. Uh, sometimes crabs produce these traces, these burrows as well. And so it's, it's hard to know what might have made these things in the past. In, in the past. And so, um, so the, here are some bones and they've also been bored. Um, and actually they come from my master's research. So um, my master's research involved trying to find out what might have made these boring marks. And these bones are from Morocco again, like the bite mark that I showed you earlier. And again, another one here and are these from the same uh, organism that created these borings here, the bivalves, or are they from something else? And this is where I come in. This is where boring girl comes in because <laughs> I study the boring. So, so, oh yeah, a job for me. Okay. <laughs> so these were my uh, research. Oh, sorry. I need to go back one. So this was my research. 
and this was one of the bones that comes from Morocco. And we do, it's a dinosaur bone, but we don't know what dinosaur produce it, it comes from, or even what part of the dinosaur it comes from, because this was bored so heavily by the organism that made these marks that it actually removed all the top surface of the bone away. So I've put a little cross section of bone and obviously it's not, it, it's not a, like a femur or anything like that, but I just wanted to show you around the edge of the bone is the very dense cortical layer. And on the inside of the bone are the, is the spongy layer, the trabecular bone. And um, this has almost all the cortical layer has, has been removed by the organism through this boring. And I think this might be a little bit of it remaining here, but the rest of it is all fossilized spongy bone. And this is the other, and, and this is a close up of some of these borings from another view of the same bone. So we wanted to find out what was it that caused these. And so one of the ways that we do that is we take a piece of the bone and we put it under a scanning electron microscope. And so just want to quickly go back, sorry. We took a section of bone out of one of these uh, little chambers and we put that under the scanning electron. And inside the scanning electron, uh, under, under the scanning electron microscope, you can see these uh, little scratches in here. And so we then looked at what things might have caused these scratches. And again, I took a silicon mold from the top of that bone and I put the silicon mold underneath uh, in the silica, in the SEA, in the scanning electron microscope. And you can see these like little arrow shaped scratch marks here. And so then we need to use our uh, knowledge of things today and uh, look to see what kind of things would feed on bone and make those kind of scratches. Oh, and I should emphasize that these bones are not found in a marine environment. They were found in a, in a, a terrestrial environment. So they were not in the deep sea or anything like that. So we can automatically exclude all those kind of organisms like the boring bivalves from our investigation because we know that the environment does not fit. So how do we, how do we decide what makes these uh, traces? So obviously we have to look at the past similar studies and we can do studies on live organisms from today and compare them to the past. And that's called actual paleontology. So in my research, I did some actual paleontology. And um, previous studies have suggested that these kind of borings have been made by these uh, ancestral insects to these uh, modern ones today. So we have these domestic beetles, which are used in museums often, and they will used in museums to strip the remaining flesh of the bone. And these are other organisms that have been found to bore into bone and eat bone. So things like termites and uh, moths, or, although there's a conjecture about moths, because although they eat like horn and hair and feathers and things like that. There, there's some people say they don't eat bone, but these are organisms that people looked at. And again, the mayfly larvae, some have suggested that they might uh, bore into bone given the opportunity. So I did a study, an actual paleontology study uh, at my home um, and subjected my husband <laughs> to um, some live domestic beetles in, in a insect uh, thing and a tank. And here is like a chicken uh, tibia, uh, a chicken leg. And this is a beef rib. And uh, we, I put them in and I left them to eat them. And I tried to starve them, which sounds really mean, but if you don't starve them and you feed them, then they're basically just not going to eat the bone. So I had to kind of push them a little bit into a situation to eat it. And um, the adults, they don't actually normally feed on the bone. They're normally uh, vegetarian eaters, so uh, uh, herb, herb, they're plant eaters. So, um, but the larvae, you can see the larvae in here, they will actually eat away at the bone. Okay. 
So then I took some sections of those bones. So this is a section of the chicken bone. And uh, you can see the chicken bone is very spongy, uh, has lots of holes. And uh, this is a cross section, and so is this, of the, of the beef, the rib bone. And uh, it, actually in here you can see uh, an open pupa, pu uh, pupa. And this one is a, a pupated larvae that actually died and never made it out. So, so what did I find? Actually, I, I, I found that the, it was very difficult to tell from living uh, stuff on my, in my study exactly but if you, this uh, larvae had died and so I put it under the SEM and I had a close look at its jaws and you can see these wear features where um, it has been scratching away on the bone and worn down the tips of its uh, its jaws and the jaws work in a when they're scratching they scratch in like an arrow shape so they fit the the shape of the scratch marks that were produced in the fossils. So we, we thought that most likely these were the culprits. And on some of the bones, it was the mayflies. So uh, that was my master's research, but now I'm looking at borings that are in the marine environment now, and they're from what we call deadfalls. So this is a modern deadfall of a whale from last year from, the, uh, from America. And uh, you can see lots of like this kind of red fluffiness on the bones and you can see it's been stripped away and you can see some of the organisms in this, in this image actually feeding on this carcass. And my, the fossils I'm working on are things like plesiosaurs and these mosasaurs and um, what we found is that they're actually, so I've looked at those. So, uh, so what happens to a, uh, something when it dies in the marine environment? So you've got this, it dies, and then it can uh, sit on the seafloor for maybe one or two years in this state being fed on. And this would be what it's like after uh, between about five and 50 years, you get this stripped carcass. So one of the, this is one of the, uh, specimens that I've been working on. And it's a mosasaur from Wakayama. And uh, actually it's the ribs. This is an image of the ribs and some of the vertebrae. You know, see that's the actual whole specimen there, but uh, you can see they're very eroded on the edges. And we wondered what was that that caused that erosion? And so we took sections and put that under the SEM and uh, it, it's actually bacteria. So bacteria have been making these very tiny, tiny borings that you can't see unless you look underneath a microscope. And again, the plesiosaur, this is a section of the bones here we, we found in the rock. And again, this one had different size borings. So some of them were the same size as the bacteria, but some of them were a little bit bigger. And we wondered what might make something like that. And going back to the modern whale uh, deadfall, you can see these fluffy areas here. And this is from the, what, what I mentioned earlier, the Ozidax, the zombie worms. And they like to feed on the bones and uh, they create borings from these little rootlets. They dig into the bone and they have like a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. And, uh, and so that's my research at the moment but I can't really tell you more about that one particularly because I'm actually still in the process of studying that. Um, and I'm hoping to go further and uh, uh, compare with some modern reptile deadfalls in uh, America and also do some field work in the UK. So, what, but the emphasis is what, what can we actually find from these, um, uh, the, from this kind of study. And it helps us to learn about what organisms were like in the past and what their diets might have been like. And it also gives us an idea of the types of behavior that they had, like their feeding or how they lived. And it also might give us an indication on how an animal died or the types of environments that they were living in and also seasonal changes because the bones that I was working on in uh, from Morocco, 
the heavily bored ones, they indicate that that bone was in a situation of seasonal dryness for a very long period of time and the food was scarce. And so insect, the insects kept coming back and feeding on the same thing because they didn't have anything else to eat. Um, so, and, and, that's, and that's it actually. <laughs> so I really, so thank you. And I'm sorry, it's a bit short, but um, that, that's my talk. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Chrissy, for a wonderful talk. Thank you very All much, right. Chrissy. That was awesome. <laughs> now, are you ready a to- A little uh... bit of a sort of uh, zoom through everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Well, uh, yeah, are you ready to take some questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, OK. All right. <laughs> well, um, so we'll- you don't see, uh, Katie, please some... keep an eye on the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, oh, we've got some we'll... talks in the Q&A. Yep, we got some uh, the question. Uh, how do, anonymous attendee says, uh, can all markings be traced to a modern day equivalent or are the, and, or are there any kinds of scratch marked patterns you haven't found a match to? Uh... Uh, there are actually yes, there are many that are not uh, easily identifiable, um, and that's why we use some. Uh, we try to compare with modern day, but you can't always do that, and um, and then those will basically just be unknown. Um, but usually they they may have some resemblance to something that we can see or somebody else might have done a study and then we can infer from what they might have found. Um, you know, sometimes uh, when I was doing my master's research, I also had to look at uh, forensic studies and archaeological studies to compare the same kind because in obviously in terrestrial environments, so they're finding those kind of uh, same kind of traces and because they're more modern they often have like the body for the you know the body of the organism that created them with that um, along with the with the carcass or whatever so um, so we have a good idea of things like the insects from stuff like that but um, with the whale falls uh, you know comparing the dead falls so those are especially because things like the the ozidax the zombie worms are so very recently you know only i think only back in like 2004 or 2005 was when they first got discovered so they're they're so very recently discovered in the modern day that you know finding traces that match that kind of thing in the ancient and knowing exactly what that is is very difficult as well as they're soft-bodied organisms, and usually those things don't preserve in the past. So you, you you can get very exceptional situations where it gets preserved, but it, it's very rare. Excellent. Uh, let's uh, keep going on with the questions here. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got a hand up as well, so we'll bring them in uh, after this one. Uh, do you have is that model behind you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Is that real or do you have other like uh, bone models at your house? Oh, this is uh, a photo on the green screen <laughs> because I have boring wardrobe behind me and I didn't want to show that. But that's a, a photo of the bone that I was working on from, the, from Morocco that I put in the, the talk. So the one with the insect boring, um, this is just a, it's a, a strange angle on the, on the image, so it probably looks a little different, but yeah, it, that's the same. That's a real bone um, from Morocco, a dinosaur bone from the Cretaceous. Cool. Okay, uh, we have a question of somebody who has their hand up in the uh, audience. Uh, uh, Alexis G Giger, uh, I'm promoting you to a panelist, so please. Uh, if you can, unmute, if you are in here, unmute yourself and Hello, uh, everyone. ask your question. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your talk. That was really uh, interesting. 
Um, I actually have two questions for you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, try, let's, we, we might be pushing. So make, it, make them quick, two quick questions. Okay. So the first one is, uh, why do larvae prefer the bone rather than the adults? Oh, okay. So I didn't explain that. Yeah. So the larvae, um, obviously they're growing and they want the nutritious marrow that's in the center of the bone. So basically, uh, they have two reasons, actually. So first of all, it's a, a feeding, so nutrition. They need that high protein from the marrow in the bone in order to be able to pupate. And that's the second reason. They use the boring, the places that they've bored into, they use those chambers as a pupation chamber in order to become an adult beetle. So it's, it, it has two, two, they have two reasons for wanting to eat the bone, basically. Yeah. Okay. So in, in forensic studies, they, they actually studied that, you know, they eat the desiccated flesh normally of a carcass. And then if the, there's no flesh remaining, they will just keep eating into the bone and they will bore into that to make their pupation chamber to change to an adult eventually. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the second one was, um, there was one image where you had the bone and the, and the, and the bacteria eating the bone. Um, so when bones are in, in museums, do they put like a special coating on them to prevent bacteria from like destroying the bone over time? Uh, I don't work in a museum, <laughs> but oh, I do, um, uh, I, they, they, they do have like preservation techniques for bones. Okay. Um, but quite often the bones you see in a museum are not actually the original specimen because they might be too fragile so um but they're usually kept in special environments and at special temperatures and stuff in order to minimize any kind of damage but there there can be bacterial erosion if the environmental conditions are not uh exact but the 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 mosasaur bone that i showed you with the bacteria that bacteria ate the mosasaur bone before the mosasaur became a fossil so uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I would have explained it better, but it's, it's difficult to explain so much stuff in such a short time. And that's a whole different talk altogether, I think, really. So uh, that, that mosasaur was uh, found in what they call a nodule uh, concretion. And inside that concretion, the bacteria had already been eating that, that organism before it had actually become a fossil. So that, that bacterial process was happening before fossilization. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, let's take a question from the YouTube. Katie, what do we got? Okay, so the first one we've got is from Wicklow Patsta. They say, great talk, thanks. And then how are the likes of dinosaur footprints actually preserved or fossilized? Uh, so usually, I mean, I don't really work on the footprints so much, but usually they're uh, like they've been filled in through a special rare event or something like that, and they get covered very quickly. And um, and and so when they actually get discovered, they they usually can disappear very quickly because they're open to erosion. So it it's you it, it's like many fossil fossil situations it's a rare event to be honest that mm -hmm. creates a fossil and in those circumstances it's, it's even rarer so maybe something like a volcanic event or a, a mudslide or something like that might have covered them over and protected them and then they they can like uh become a fossil yeah over time <laughs> thank you all right i'm not i know i'm not an expert on dinosaur footprints so, <laughs> so i'm sure that someone else can answer that better than me you gotta introduce us to somebody like that. oh uh, if i know someone i will <laughs> okay uh, should we do uh, we've got one more question from youtube yeah let's go with the other youtube question um uh, harisma buranda <laughs> say is it possible to identify the original depositional environment of the animals of your research yes it is um, it is possible through uh, through sediment. Uh, usually, there's like uh, 
the sediment with the bone. And so you can tell from that what the original uh, environment might have been before. And if you can work out what the organism is, or uh, yeah, there's all sorts of things like on the bone behind me, there's lots of things like hairline cracking and stuff, which indicates uh, like a dried atmosphere and, you know, sort of like drought. And, uh, and so, yeah, we can tell the environment from many, uh, many things like that. Okay, uh, let's uh, continue on. We got a couple more minutes and we got two more, maybe enough for two more, one or two more. Uh, let's see. What, uh, from Melvin Charles Dye, what challenges are unique to working on sea fossils that are different from the terrestrial counterparts? Uh, I don't know, actually. Um, well, well, the fact is that you know that it's hard to find them. Uh, no, actually, they both they both have their difficulties. Uh, terrestrial fossils are not often uh, there's more there's more marine fossils actually than there are terrestrial ones. To be honest, but we we find more of those um, because the terrestrial ones are usually open to scavengers and kind of things like that, and they often don't survive fossilization. But you know. Uh, it does happen, obviously. Um, but marine, again, uh, there's different organisms uh, predating and scavenging on those uh, carcasses and things. And so, you know, those those are under different kind of stresses, I think. Um, they're both difficult, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's not a very good answer. <laughs> Ah, it, it's it's all right. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Let's uh let's do a quick two quick couple more. Uh, what kind of bacteria do you find on the bones? Very uh, the sulfur. That actually we're we're kind of in the process of trying to work out exactly what they are, but they're uh, methogenic and sulfur reducing bacteria that are usually working in those environments because it's an anoxic environment so there's no oxygen normally uh, at those depths and also because they've been covered in the sediment um, and those uh, bacteria are usually working in that and and also those uh, a, a type of those bacteria are the ones that are having the symbiotic relationship with the ozidax or that's at the moment that's uh, my understanding from what I have uh, read of previous studies and modern day, you know, uh, because we don't really know much about those kind of organisms in the past. People are only just finding about that and, you know, thinking that that's what might have caused those borings in the past. But we, we know so little about those ones, in, even in the modern day environment. So uh, we're still, uh, I'm still learning about that, really. We're still discovering that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, we have a couple more questions to go through, but we're run, uh, we're run out of time. So we'll uh, post the questions in the chat for you to answer, and then we'll throw the answers back into the YouTube channel for the people who've asked it on the YouTube. So, uh, you know, everybody can't like clap, but uh, please give another uh, round of applause to Chrissy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for letting me do the talk. Very <laughs> scary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a funny thing because you were introduced to us, but we've actually never, this is like the first time we've met you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's fantastic. But you're at Kyoto University, so we should uh, we should talk sometime. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will try when everything goes back to normal, I will try and join the, the Kyoto uh, nerd night. I did intend to, and then the pandemic happened, and I couldn't. Do uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it certainly uh, stuck us uh, monkey wrench into <laughs> much <laughs> of our uh, schedules. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so we will take another ten minute break, and then we'll pass this on to Nerd Night Tokyo.
Because you've got just two minutes to get back in your seat, catch the last talk of the evening. Get that drink, take that pee. Thank you. 
Hey, just a reminder, if you're just joining us now, that uh, Nerd Night Tokyo functions as a fundraiser for the Oklahoma Theater Group, which is a non-profit theater company. Um, obviously, things are shut down right now because of COVID-19. Uh, and we're not doing live nerd nights and uh, selling tickets and that, that kind of thing. So if you'd like to help us out, if you're enjoying yourself tonight, and you can, if you're in a position where you can, I know a lot of us who are uh, freelancers and other types of workers have not got a lot of income right now. But if you do and you are and you can and you want to, uh, check out ytg.jp and uh, help us out. Maybe buy a virtual ticket uh, for a thousand yen. Uh, or whatever, uh, whatever you like, whatever you, you can spare would be helpful to us. Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Hey, hello. So uh, we're back. Let me turn on my light so people can see me. Um, yeah, have I been... Uh, so much going on. Okay, just getting a handle on this. Uh, let me share my screen here. This is, uh, I'm Andrew, in case you don't know me. Which screen is it? Shoot, which one is it? Is it this one? That looks promising. All right, um, right. So in case you don't know me, I'm Andrew. I'm one of the co-bosses uh, of Tokyo Nerd Night. And just really quickly, I just want to say, um, we actually, I don't, I, we have a pretty big team at Nerd Night Tokyo. And I just, and a lot of them are listening tonight. And I just wanted to say, guys, I miss you. Um, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Uh, up here, this is our Facebook and our Twitter thingies. Uh, let me move on to the next slide. Oh, that's where, nope, that's going backwards. That's Okay, going forwards. So we're going to probably have our next Nerd Night, June 26th. Uh, the guests will be Square, Square, and Square. Um, wait, can nobody hear me? Am I good? I'm sorry, I'm hearing stuff coming through. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, Square, Square, and Square. And yeah, I uh, hope you'll join us. It'll be great. Those squares will be filled in with actual people, and it'll be fantastic. Um, you've uh, you've heard me talk about uh, of uh, YTG in the sport. I sort of did the thing on there, um, the announcement thing. So you've heard that. I won't belabor that. There's the link in case you couldn't pick it up from uh, what I was saying. Uh, also, you can, we normally at Nerd Night Tokyo, we sell these beakers and we're selling them online. They're a bit pricier because we've, we've got to ship them out. And uh, yeah, but if you want to, you can also get them at the same place. There's a buy a beaker link there. If you have any trouble with that, please uh, contact us directly using those links down there ha ha you see what i did there anyway um right so i need to introduce our next speaker which means i've got to find this window okay um is uh, is kathleen kathleen ready is your mic unmuted and stuff because we're gonna switch over in a second yep i'm here okay. yay um this is i'd like to introduce you all to uh kathleen beauchemin uh, she was born in Montreal, Canada. Her first language is French. Her second is English. And she is working toward making Japanese her third. Uh, Kathleen earned her PhD in physics from the University of Alberta in 2005 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New Mexico and Los Alamos National Laboratory. She's been a professor of physics at Ryerson University in Toronto since 2007. That is my hometown. Um, and uh, Ryerson's pretty cool. Kathleen is connected to Japan as a senior visiting scientist in the Institute for Theoretical and Mathematical Science Sciences. And there's, uh, Kathleen, how do you pronounce that acronym? Do you know? Which acronym? I, 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 I Is it ITEMS or IBEMS? ITEMS. ITEMS. So it's like oh, a. Okay, you're asking so a French person about THs. So that's <laughs> it's not a very, I, I was like, is it the European pronunciation or is it the English pronunciation? Um, uh, yes, ITEMS at RECEN in Saitama since 2016. Kathleen specializes in uh, virophysics, which means applying methods from physics to analyze and predict how a virus spreads within a cell culture or a person. And now she's gonna talk about what she's doing during the pandemic, and she will also take questions about COVID-19. So uh, let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Boop, boop. 
All right, we're back here. And um, Kathleen, when you're ready, you can uh, take it away. This is where we normally applaud, but it's, yeah, not that environment. Uh, you've muted your microphone again, Kathleen. Oh, she, she can't. There we go. Sorry oh, about that. Yes. Okay. Yay. Okay. I will go quiet. Now, now I feel like a Canadian politician or any politician, really. <laughs> um, all right. So I've been well introduced. So um, in case you were wondering how to pronounce my name, I've written it down here in Katakana. But um, basically, Andrew did a great job. So let's move on to the next topic. Um, Andrew said most of that, so I'm going to focus mostly on saying that uh, my research field, um, as my slide says, is virophysics, or in Japanese, virus butsurigaku. Um, and what's funny about this is, um, well, I'm a physicist, and I'm now doing virology. And the problem is, funding in Canada is structured in such a way that being a physicist who does virology, you kind of fall between all the chairs. So um, I decided to try and help myself by making up a field so that I wouldn't end up with all the disadvantages of the various fields I could claim. So I made my own territory and just baptized it virophysics as a way to improve my chance of getting a grant. Um, but that kind of catches on. So I maybe would recommend that to other people. So all I did was uh, claim that virophysics was my research um, on an application. I made you know, uh, a Wikipedia page to make this very legit. And before long, I was the founder of the field of virophysics and admitted into the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada. So definitely a good move. Oh, and I also got the grant. Um, so I would recommend it if you find that uh, your research field is a bit too poorly defined and causing you problem at grant time, you should consider making your own field. <laughs> so enough of that. So what is it that I do? Well, I'm a physicist by training and the way physics works, of course, is that you have an observation, um, you can maybe remember from high school, uh, apples falling from trees. And so you'd collect data and you try to analyze the data. And in particular in physics, you'd resort to um, something like the kinematic equations to try and describe the motion of the object over time. Um, and what that allows you to see is number one, it, the, the, the experiment has allowed you to confirm whether your theory um, can indeed predict um, the shape of the curve and where it will go next. Um, but the other advantage that you get, so this, so this is kind of an error correction between whether the math is correct or, or if the experiment is causing issues and there's a conflict, then you can resolve it. You can see that your, your understanding or explanation is not quite right. Um, and what it gives you for free then is also the ability to predict. So you can say, well, what happens if I double the initial speed of the apple um, or, or, or half it? And so you can have that kind of um, information there. Um, in virology, and so I, I was kind of new at sort of, well, many years ago to the field of virology, and, and it surprised me at the, the differences in particular. So here, uh, the analysis, you could see not much difference, but already you can start seeing difference. Here, the curve clearly came from somewhere else, whereas here you can see the points are really just joined by straight line just to really help guide your eye. Um, so, so already you can start seeing the differences. When it comes to explanation, you can see that the math has turned to text. The cells, when they're infected with influenza, they'll produce, let's say, 10 to the 6 plaque forming unit per milliliter. Um, and so you can say stuff about what you observe. You can describe it in words. Um, but then the problem with that is you lose the ability to validate and predict. And so in particular, if you wanted to know what happens if you put twice as much virus, well, you have to ask for more money. Um, if you imagine, this is the equivalent of when NASA is developing new new um, engines or whatever, they say, well, we'll just keep throwing them at the sky until one of them stays up. Um, so, so it's a real issue to not have the math behind the theory to make sure that you're not going the wrong way. So, so experiments alone basically are not predictive and they're easily misinterpreted. And I'll give examples of that. Um, experiments in theory together are required to robustly advance research. And, and of course, I hope I'll have convinced you of that by the time we're through here. So firstly, let's look at this one of the common experiments you can do to try and decide uh, how infectious or virulent a virus is. So this is uh, for influenza, so flu. Um, and so what these whole these circles are, it's a single cell culture of, of um, with virus infecting the cells. And you can see that it develops into these plaques. And I'll talk to that, about that a bit more later. But what you can see is that in some, so this is the wild type virus. 
and this is one type of mutation. This is another type. I'll pick this one. So it's a valine to alanine. So at position 27, they traded one amino acid for another. And so that's what this encoding means. It's a similar kind of idea for all of these. And what you see here is the, the average diameter of the plaques in that assay when that virus infects the cell. And so this is 4.87 plus or minus 0 0.54 millimeter in diameter for the plaques. Um, and this was in particular was meant to identify what happens to various mutants. Um, and these mutants are, have been chosen because they're amantadine resistant. So amantadine is one of the old influenza drug. Um, and so this is the virus influenza A, uh, WSN33. So it's an H1N1 influenza. And so this is the wild type and its mutants. And, and this one in particular is basically nearly fully, very strongly resistant to amantadine compared to the wild type. So, so you can do these experiments and see, well, if you have a mutation like S31N that makes you resistant to amantadine, does that mean that the virus um, just wins because it, it's resistant or does it lose something in the trait? So to mutate away from amantadine, do you end up being, let's say, less virulent? And, and so this is one of the ways you could verify, did the plaques get smaller? Now you can see the plaques actually got uh, bigger. Now, if you look at the error bar, it's not statistically significant, um, but basically um, this is how you could assess whether the mutation has compromised the, the fitness of the virus, right? Um, so, but we wondered, do you get the full story? Does that plaque size really tell you everything you need to know about how strong the virus is uh, in presence of a mutation? And, and what does the plaque size indicate? What does it tell you about the virus? So, they're growing, so my experimental colleagues are growing plaques in, in, in vitro. So vitro is uh, just uh, Latin for glass. Um, and so, so in, in a lab, and, and so what I do is I grow plaques in a computer or in silico is what they say. Um, so in silicone slash computer. Um, here, this well is 3.5 centimeter across. There's about a million cells. They're sitting at the bottom. And on top of these cells, so they're, they're attached at the bottom. They form a tight grid. And on top of them, there's a, a jello or agar overlay. And what happens is when a cell becomes infected, it starts spewing out virus. The virus can't go everywhere because it's stuck in the jello. So it can only slide under jello, the jello and infect the next cells, which, which can only then, so only its neighbor cell. And these cells can only infect the neighbor and so on and so forth. So that's how you see those plaques. What happens is the wave moves outward, uh, the infection wave moves outward, it leaves at the core, the cells that have been infected the longest, and these cells begin to die. And so that's how you see those holes. So having explained that, um, we can start constructing a model of, of how this infection might spread. So bear with me here. So you have an uninfected cell. And what happens is when the virus combines with the cell at some rate beta, the infection rate, the cells become what's called in the eclipse phase, and the eclipse phase is when the cell is infected, but not yet producing virus. Um, after some amount of time, tau e, uh, the cell will come out of the eclipse phase and become an infectious cell, meaning that it's now producing virus at some rate. And after some amount of time, that cell stops producing virus and either dies or, or gets better. Um, and we'll come back to that, obviously, when I'll talk about epidemics later. So, so the infectious cell produces virus. That virus will lose infectivity at some rate. So how long does, for example, COVID-19 stay on a surface? And do you really have to disinfect your groceries? So that's what that, that parameter, knowing that parameter is how you answer those questions. And then if the virus that's left can go on to infect other cells. So that's the virophysics, basically the theoretical math behind, so I'm not showing you the math, I'm sparing you the detail on this slide, uh, behind virus infection. So what can you do with that? Well, what you can do is you can simulate a plaque assay and see what happens. And, and what you can see here is, let's say this is the, the plaque speed and not the actual radius, but you can imagine if I multiply by time, then this is the plaque radius. So if you have this speed of plaque in one strain and this speed of plaque in a different strain, well, that different strain can have, a bit, uh, can have bigger plaque because it's got a higher speed, so a bigger radius. It can either get to that speed by having four times shorter an eclipse phase, meaning it takes uh, four times less time for that cell to produce virus once it's infected with that virus, or that cell produces a thousand times more virus. Now that's important. So this is a thousand times more. This is just a fourfold change. So this is a quarter less or a thousand times more. So what you can conclude from having had this map is number one, um, this experiment is much more sensitive to how long it takes a cell to produce virus, this direction, than it is to 
uh, how much virus the cell produced, which is in this direction. And you might ask yourself, well, why should I care? Well, if you decide that the plaque size tells you something about the virus and you think, well, this virus is stronger than this other virus, it might not be true because in a context where the cell doesn't just infect its neighbor, but can infect any other cell. So if you don't have the jello on top, but you have a liquid uh, medium, well, then that, that strain that has more virus production would probably do lots better, possibly. And you won't know unless you conduct that experiment or you use the theory to predict it. So, so inferring simply by just looking at the plaque size, you might incorrectly conclude which strain would take over if the two strains were competing. And so, so that's one example of where um, really the model has allowed you to understand better what you were looking at. Before it was just points and full change. Now you know why, how they came about. Now, by the way, for all the papers I mentioned, I've got um, a URL, sorry, I've got a QR code there that'll take you to the, the specific paper. All right, so what else do I do? So this is an example of, of how I apply stuff. So I'm currently, uh, I'm busy, well, I would be busy developing a quantization model. So we're trying to turn the model I just described, instead of having fraction of cells and fraction of virus, we plan on having full integer number of cell and integer number of virus uh, and always accounting for that. What that means is that if um, a cell has a maybe 20% probability of infecting a virus, then you have to model both that 20% outcome and that 80% outcome and see the distribution of outcomes you can get. I'm also working on gamma ray burst afterglow. So this is astrophysics now in collaboration with Don Warren, who's also has items. Uh, and he's a regular speaker at Nerd Night. And in this case, we're trying to find a simpler expression uh, for the maximum momentum of particles in a gamma ray burst afterglow. Um, and because otherwise, the way to know this is to run a very complex and long and slow uh, computer model. Um, another work we're, we're working on uh, with also with Chacha at Kyushu University, um, she's also uh, previously from ITEMS and she's been a previous Nerd Night speaker. Um, we're trying to look at the equivalence mapping between two map models of virus infection, two different representation of the same thing. Um, I'm also working to some extent in cancer with some colleagues at Ryerson University. So this is what I would normally be up to right now because it's the summer and I finished teaching. Except of course, um, like the rest of you, uh, COVID-19 happened to, to, to me here as well, um, which is why I'm in Toronto right now and not in Tokyo. Um, and what happened is I found that the information that was coming out about the pandemic, for one thing early on, was completely in contradiction to what I could actually see from the data that was already available. Um, and the other thing is I had questions that, that were not getting answered, that I could look through the literature, I could look through papers coming out, I could listen to the news, and they were simply not tackling what I've considered to be rather important questions. So I kind of accidentally started involving myself in, in trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so I want to share with you some of the basics about, about epidemics so that you can also now listen to the news with perhaps uh, more insight. So, so first I want to introduce two concepts that you've probably heard about by now if you're remotely curious about the epidemic, and that's the reproductive number and the serial interval, with the first uh, of these two being more popular in terms of popular culture. You've heard about this one, you might not have heard about the second one. So reproductive number is if you're an infected person, the question is how many other people will you infect before you stop be being infectious? So either because you died or you recovered um, or you've been put in self-isolation. Um, I guess if self-isolation, you've put yourself in self-isolation. Um, and so, for example, in my example here, that's three. So, so one person will infect, on average, three other people. Um, and then each of these will infect three other people. And so you start from having one infected person to having after some amount of time. So it takes you, let's say, tau r, and that's where we introduce the serial interval. And that's the amount of time between generations. So how long will it take for you to become infectious and then approximately half the time it takes you to, to, to infect all the people you'll infect in the second round. So that's roughly the distance between different generations here in this model. So, so you start with the, R, the basic reproductive number to the power of zero, you have one infected individual is where you start, and then that infected individual will infect three, so it's R to the one, so you've got three infected individual after time tau R, after time two tau R, then you end up with R to the two, so you've got nine infected individuals, and when you get to three tau r, you have r to the cube, and so that's three times three times three, and so you end up with um, uh, with 27 infected individual. Now you can see that very rapidly you grow out a space to draw these little figures, um, and so it actually goes pretty fast. 
hence the importance of flattening the curve. So let's talk about that in a second. So you can use a model like this. And in fact, uh, you can transform this kind of math reasoning um, into an equation, which you find is actually roughly this. Um, and so when one tau r has, has elapsed, you have tau r over tau r, so that's the one. If two tau r has elapsed, you have two tau r over tau r, that's two, you have nine. And, and this basically fills in the gap between these generations. If you take the ln, so the log, the natural logarithm on both sides of this equation, the equation starts looking like this. There's a y here. This is your x-axis here. This is time. This is the log of the number of cases. And so what you can see is that you get naturally the slope and the y-intercept. That means that if you put a graph of the log of the number of cases versus the time, what you'll see is a straight line. And the straight line, with which we call the slope, is this m here. So if you remember from my school, y equal mx plus b, by taking the log of the left-hand side, but keeping the linear version of time, you'll get a straight line. Do we? Well, we sort of do. So this is uh, the, the cumulative number of cases for different countries. And you can see that early on, it's a pretty straight line. This is Italy. Um, and so early on in the pandemic, they were having about 38% um, increase in cases per day, or a doubling, the number of cases doubled every two days. Um, and you can see that there's a fair amount of consistency uh, in, in the various countries um, for their early times. Um, so, so, well, especially USA, Italy, and Canada. You can see that the Asian countries really had a different story going on. So if you look at Singapore here in yellow, or Japan, which is probably of, of greatest interest here, um, you can see that mostly, well, it's not quite straight because there's been a lot more um, tight handling of the, of, the, of the epidemic, but you can see that there's, even though there's pulsing in it, it's basically a straight line trend. Um, and you can see that the case double every 10 days. So where it takes 10 days for Japan to double their case, it took Canada just three days to do the same, which is not a good thing. Um, and so that's good for a while, but then when the curve starts flattening out, which, it, which you can see clearly here, um, this is not very good. You can still make a straight line, let's say, to the end and see what's the current doubling time. But if you wanted to see a little bit further into the future and, and start doing some predictions, uh, you'd really have to do something more sophisticated. Now, by the way, this is the website where I keep these daily plots maintained, and I have more countries if you go to that website. Um, and I keep these rates, these daily rates uh, updated. All right, so let's get to the fancier model. So, so this is good because it describes what's happening now. But you want to know what happens, what, what's really going on behind the scene, and what will happen later, just like we did in the plaque assay. So here's how you would represent this. You've got a susceptible which can become uh, latently infected, meaning the person is infected but not yet producing virus. Um, and in some amount of time later, this person becomes uh, infectious, uh, presumably, oh dear, I think something's gone terribly wrong. I will wait for my cursor to stop moving. Huh? Maybe we're fine. Um, so, nope. So basically, you're infectious. And, and at first, you're just infectious. So, so here's the interesting thing we found with COVID-19 is that um, the person becomes infectious roughly a day before they become symptomatic. And so you spend a whole day uh, feeling perfectly fine, uh, but passing on the virus, uh, possibly quite effectively, um, before you start feeling ill. Um, then eventually you then feel ill. And, and when you start feeling ill, that's when you're likely to be tested. And once you're tested, uh, if you test positive, you're going to isolate. But even if you feel symptomatic, the recommendation is that you should self-isolate. And so very quickly after you become symptomatic, possibly you'll be what we call removed. So either you've been hospitalized, out isolated, or you it will eventually recover or might die. Now, for the purpose of you personally, uh, which one you are of these three makes a big difference. But for the purpose of the replication, so how many other people will become infected, um, really this number is the important number and how many people you have left to, to infect. So these are the quantities that are very relevant in terms of um, modeling and predicting. And these are the quantities that are of biggest interest to public health and, and probably to you uh, personally. So once you transform um, these kind of states into equation, it, you can start to infer hidden quantities. Uh, so for example, the true number of infected. So this is how many cases you have. What does that tell you about how many, you really, how many people are really infected? It also allows you to predict the future. So how many people will get sick? When will this all end? Can we reopen? 
And so these questions really require a, a fancier model. And this is the fancier model. Now, I'm not going to completely uh, dive into all the math here. Uh, I'm happy to do that in the question or if you send me an email later. But you can be a susceptible person goes into latent. And from latent, you can go into latent 1, latent 2, latent 3. And then once you leave the last phase of latent, you enter infectious and so on and so forth until you end up in the recovered state. So here in the equation, you start out here. And so this is how many people you infect. This is our reproductive number, how many people you infect uh, per amount of time that you're infectious. So divide by the number of time, the amount of time for which you're infectious. So that's the, the, no, the rate at which you infect people. And you see here, what I do is I multiply this by the ratio of susceptible to total people. Because let's say on average, you'll, you'll encounter 10 people a day. Um, and, and that's how many people then you can infect. Um, but if half of them are susceptible, only half of them are susceptible, then you infect only half of the total number you could infect. So that's why that density here is important. And this is the total number of people who are infectious right now. So people who are in this class. Um, you could see that what I remove from S, there's a big minus sign here, I add to the first latent phase. So I remove them from S and place them in the first latent state. And then they move on to the second and third and fourth, eventually walk out the end, enter the infectious phase, and then go from second, third, fourth, eventually exit and enter the recovered state. So that's basically the ODE version or ordinary differential equation version of this kind of cartoon that I've got there. And the game basically is to use the data to figure out what the value of all these parameters are. So, so here's the data and, and I'll take you through all these graphs individually. Here, let's start in the bottom left corner. So the bottom left corner is actually showing you the kind of data that the news gives you uh, on, the, on the evening news, right? So this is the daily count of cases. This is for Canada. And so you can see that it can be getting that information can be a bit of a roller coaster because, for example, this day you had um, maybe 300 cases. You're like, oh, well, I guess we're doing pretty good. And then you turn on the news the next day and then you learn there's 1500 new cases. You're like, oh, dear, what, what have we done? What will we do? Um, and then you turn on the news the following day and it's like, oh, no, well, wait, it's back to 700. So it's really a bit of a roller coaster. And those are the information you get on the news. And so you really feel like you don't have a good handle on things. The world is confusing and scary. Um, and it's just not ideal. It's kind of like the, the download cursor for, for Windows. You've got five minutes left on your download. Oh, wait, 10 hours. Oh, wait, three seconds. So it's quite a roller coaster. But you can see that there are different ways to represent this data. For one thing, you can look at the cumulative curves. And those are the curves I was showing you earlier. And already now you can see you know, there's kind of a, a phase here and a phase there, maybe another phase there. And you could see that reflected in the data here. It was flat here. You could see that raise here. But here's the thing. There seems to be kind of something else going on here. And you can't really see it in here. Uh, but if you go to the log scale, you start seeing different scales here uh, for the problem. Um, in the log scale, you start seeing, you know, a corner here, a flat. So this here, this is the cumulative data. This is the same data here, but I've made my y-axis log scale like I did on the previous plot. Here, this is the daily count, so not the cumulative count over time. And here, the only thing I've done going from here to here is I've made my y-axis log. And suddenly, the data that was all squished here is suddenly very informative. I can see that it was growing at a fixed exponential rate. So a straight line on a logarithmic linear plot gives me a straight line means it's exponential, like we were seeing before. And then it goes flat, and then it looks like maybe things are getting better. But here's what happens when you put the model. Ta-da! Now suddenly, you start seeing much more clearly what phases exist. And, and not just that, if you've got the model, you can start associating a reproductive number with each of the phase. So you can see that early on, Canada has a reproductive, had a reproductive number of 2.61, meaning each person on average, um, infected about 2.61 other people before um, they, they recovered uh, or died. Um, in the second phase, we got that down to 1.08, and you could see it was growing very fast, and then it kind of went a bit flatter. Um, but then you could see what happens, the beauty of what happens when you fall below one. When you fall below one, meaning you infect slightly less people um, than, than you, so, so one is replacement. I infect exactly when I, when I stop being infected, I've made somebody else infected. So the, the count would stay the same, right? Um, but if you infect less than one, then the count decreases every day. And you can see that 
has happened in the data, and you can see that borne out in the numbers. So of course, maybe you don't care very much about Canada. So let's look at Saitama. And you can see that as noisy as Canada was, uh, the, daily, the data in the daily count in Saitama is even more uh, difficult to follow and get a sense of. Um, but again, let's do our trick again and put the model in. And then suddenly the model can really guide your eye. Now you might not believe uh, this is the correct model because it sounds like I could draw just about any line through these uh, noisy points. Already in log scale, the data looks a bit more organized, a bit tighter around what I'm telling you is, 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 is the curve for, for that period. Um, in the cumulative, you can see it much nicer. What you can see is that early on, actually, um, Saitama had a good handle on it with a fairly small R compared to the early time R for Canada. Um, it then spiked out to basically Canada level, which is never a good thing. Um, and then now they're doing far better at a nice 0 0.68. And you can see how rapidly the cases are dropping off. Now that's the beauty of having the model, but you can do one better. I talked about prediction and I was not kidding. So for example, if you want to see the future, so here on the left, these are the same plot we had on the previous slide on the right, because I like the log scale better, because you can see structure a lot better in the log scale. So these are the same two graphs, but here I've actually allowed the curve to keep going so you could see what would happen. Well, it, it doesn't need a genius to know that this is basically, if we kept this up at the current reproductive number, we're basically done. So this is actual data. So we're past where I'm predicting. So I'm predicting a straight line because we're done. Um, and so what that would mean is by the end of it, if we stay the course and we stay uh, closed in our house the way uh, people are in Saitama, then you get approximately by the end of it, maybe 0.02% of the population, a bit less, uh, will become infected or roughly a thousand people will have been, um, sorry, not a, a thousand cases will have been uh, compiled and about a hundred people will die. Now, what the model gives you is how many people were actually infected because you've not, the cases haven't caught all of them. So you can see now the confidence is a bit wider, but somewhere between a thousand, either you caught everyone or, or about two, uh, 20,000, you, you're missing a, a good number of cases will have been affected by the infection. So will we'll have either been reported as cases, that's at the lower end, or will have not, a, a good fraction of them will have not been reported as cases, and so you have more cases than, than you, you've detected. And so that's what you can get as a bonus for this with this analysis. Um, you can also see what happens if you reopen. So this is here, I've changed this graph here where you reopen uh, at the end of, of May, basically. So this is, this is the end of May, and this is the offset for before you see the effect. And what you could see is that you can imagine the, court, the, sh the cases will shoot back up, but imagine a situation where we close again at the end of July. We can bring that back down and we can keep oscillating that and for a while and, and, and so that we can eventually get everybody infected so that we have this, um, this protection in the population that everybody will have gone through this and then we can reopen. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that every time you reopen, uh, if we, if we kept that same cycle over and over again, you kill a hundred people with each iteration. You're slowly making sure everybody's been kind of inoculated by the virus, but basically by becoming infected. And that will cause a lot of death. And so it's not clear really how you should proceed. So those models can at least let you explore what are the different options. Um, there are no great options right now, but at least you know your options. So that's basically all I really wanted to share with you today. And what I hope you'll take away from this is that when you just look at data alone, it can be confusing and even misleading. If you add a mathematical model as a description of your data, it can show you the signal and the noise. So you can start seeing better what's actually going on. And then if you combine the data with the model, it allows you to forecast, maybe tweak, and even optimize your strategy. What should we do? Um, how should we proceed? And what will be the consequence of these decisions? So, so that's basically all I had to say. I'm not exactly sure how much time I have because I'm full screen and my clock is hidden. Um, I have a binary clock on my wall, but I'm not good at reading it fast. Um, but at this point, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. And if you want, you could go to this website if you want to see uh, more of the plots or more of my work, or you can send me an email if I don't get to your question today. And that's it. Thank you for listening. And I'll take uh, as many questions as you have that we have time for. Super, super. Um, so let me just, uh, if you could end your screen share there, Kathleen, so we can see, yep. uh, we've got someone who wants to, Jesse here wants to ask a question. I'm going to promote him to him or her actually, or them. Sorry if I've Hi. misgendered somebody. Hey, Hi. Um, 
I had a question. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, have you been able to learn any new biological facts about viruses by modeling them? New biological facts? Yes, I think I could say that. Um, so, for example, we've been working at some point with the syncytal, uh, respiratory syncytal virus. So it's another respiratory virus. And um, what we found about, so what people always knew about this virus is that it degrades very rapidly. Meaning uh, once a person, uh, sorry, once you take the virus out of a person, let's say you take a nasal swab and you try to culture that, that virus in a lab, almost immediately, most of the virus loses infectivity. And that's different from flu. Flu would lose infectivity much slower. Um, so by doing a modeling of, of that, that decay, what we learn is that uh, possibly the reason for why that virus is decaying so fast. So we learn what function explains uh, how there, it's decaying at that speed yeah. and, and what, what function describes it. And what it taught, taught us is that the virus, um, it, it was a, the decay, if I describe it just in word, normally I show you a graph, but uh, if I describe it just in word, it's basically, it, it's a rapid decay and then it like, flattens out kind of like the epidemic curve but inverted so it goes fast at the start and then slow and and usually that's a signature of a production process that is uh, faulty so when a virus is produced um so you can imagine a factory if um well maybe a dell computer uh factory because that's been my problem with dell you buy them and a large fraction of them are dead on, on arrival so you receive your computer turn it on it does not boot um but then once you get the replacement laptop, uh, they usually work very well. And if you've got a computer that that died or that 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 didn't die, uh, it'll work fine once it's 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 past that. And that usually means that the, the production process is maybe a bit faulty. Um, but um, the, the when they're not defective, they work well. And that's exactly what was happening with these viruses. They're produced in a way, and it would be a bit complicated to explain, but they're produced in a way that um, it creates a it, it, they have a high probability of having a defect happen as they get released from the cell. And those who have the defect will very rapidly fail. And those that did not have the defect then have that stability. So you lose them out of the population at first early on, and then it flattens out the loss. And so that's that's an example, I guess, of where we were able to use the map to try and tease away what might be behind this. Great. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, a question from YouTube. Uh, Someone said, great presentation, thank you. That's a good point, because you're a presentation, thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> as, okay, here's the question. As you probably heard, a lot of people are skeptical, uh, skeptical about Japan infected numbers. What is your take on that? My take on it is, I mean, I flip flop all over the place since the start of this epidemic, looking at this data and just scratching my head. Because, I mean, you saw from the presentation, uh, the Asian country, and it's not just Japan, if you look at Singapore, if you look at South Korea, um, and these are all different scenarios, um, but, but basically what you could see is very slow growth. And, and the question is, is there an Asian effect? Um, is that you know, bad reporting? Is that um, some sort of, 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 of genetic uh, protection or, or, or environmental exposure to a similar virus that gives you some protection? Uh, the quick answer is I'm not really sure at this stage still. What I would say is that, for example, if you look at China, their early growth rate was very similar than in the rest of, of Europe and, and Canada and the US. So, so certainly it doesn't seem to be in favor. Like, why would China have uh, not have this protection, but um, you know, Hong Kong uh, very close by would, right? And so, so it's, it's, it doesn't seem to, to really pan out. Um, now they might have different flora and fauna and maybe that's it. I don't know enough about that. Maybe another Nerd Night speaker would know about those things. Another possibility is very good control. Um, meaning that um, when they find a, 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 an infected subject, they go into massive testing mode, massive contact tracing, and they isolate everyone. In particular, what I know is that Japan, for example, takes people, and as soon as you're tested positive as a case, you are taken in. Basically, you're put in a hotel bed or you're put in a hospital bed. You're not left to, to send home and self-isolate and, and hoping that you will, you will obey the, 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 the request. Um, or, or in fact, the order in some cases, right? And so I think that might help people not wonder if you're detected as a case, you're locked in. And not just that, at that point, they'll trace down all your contact, chase them all down, test them, and also isolate them in hospital bed. So what that means though, is that they're kind of, um, the, the bed situation can be a bit problematic for Japan, but that might be the reason why these numbers are so low. It's better testing, more extensive, sorry, better testing, more extensive testing. And for example, South Korea also had numbers similar to China early on, and they got their numbers to what I would call Japan numbers very quickly thereafter because of massive testing. So 
that's what I would say about that. If you hear weird banging, it's my cat. He's scratching himself. You might see him walk in the background. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Did you did you hear about the newest uh, theory that they, they had on NHK, I think, yesterday or the day before, which is the reason why the infection rate in Japan is so low is because the way they pronounce their P's doesn't throw as much spittle out? Right. I've heard a lot of different, <laughs> very interesting cultural theories. Uh, you know, Japanese people tend to wear more masks. Japanese people don't hug and kiss. Uh, but here in Canada, we're definitely not hugging and kissing anymore. I mean, people are very careful and very distant. Now, not everybody is careful, but the point is, I would say that our current level of distancing is maybe the natural Japanese distancing. And and it's not it's not been as helpful for Canada. So So to me, the various stories I hear about you know, cultural quirks of the Japanese that are making them protected, I, I would not put much stuck into that. <laughs> so I'd be happy to be surprised. <laughs> um, so a uh, question from the, the uh, from, sorry, the, um, one of the attendees in the Zoom meeting is, uh, is does your model talk about herd immunity? And um, he, he had, he, they had, they had, I think COVID is going to stay in long term. I guess that's right. Kind of so, so, so to talk about um, protective, so wait, is it herd immunity slash protective immunity. The idea is that um, if enough people have gotten the virus, or for example, if by some miracle we get a vaccine, um, then what happens is uh, you can vaccinate a bunch of people, or a bunch of people have already been exposed. And the hope, of course, is that these people are still protected against reinfection. And so eventually, the number, it comes down to that, that equation I showed before with the S over N, that even if you could infect 10 people, if only half or a third of these people are infected, then you'll infect only three instead of, of 10. And so you can imagine those numbers starting to go down for the same amount of effort in, in distancing measure, you get a much higher efficacy because already your, your rate at which you can infect other people is naturally reduced by the fact that there's fewer people to infect out there. So will we get to herd immunity? That's a very good question for two reasons. Uh, to get significant number of people infected means you'll have significant pe people dead, right? So that's what I was talking about. The re the, if we reopen, we can get more people exposed so we can get that closer to kind of global herd immunity, but that means every time we reopen, more people are going to die because for each infected people, some people will die. If you talk then about the vaccine, well, if we did have a vaccine, that would be helpful, but I, I'm not so help I'm not so hopeful about the vaccines. Um, so so that's not that's not where my thinking is. Uh, and in terms of, of how long we'd be protected, uh, I mean your guess is as good as anybody's at this point. Um, there people are talking about people becoming reinfected. I don't think that's the case. If I had to put money on it, I would say that the people who seem to be reinfected are actually people who remain infected over the entire period and have a blip again in their virus. Um, I think that's much more likely. So I would think that you're probably immune for, I mean, if I had to guess, I would be surprised if you're not immune for at least a year. Um, I, it would be surprising to me, but I'm, I'm saying that out of gut feeling, not data. So you should, you should know that. <laughs> Cool. You're being upstaged by your cat, by the way. I know. He's, he's pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, another question from YouTube. They're coming in a bit fast and furious right now. Um, yes. Does your, uh, does your model of COVID-19 or your models, do your models of COVID-19 also consider the possibility of uh, mutations? And is there, in general, in there, is there a way to predict if a virus is more or less likely to mutate? Right. Okay. So... Right now, no. The model has a single virus and the virus has the same kind of properties over time, you're, meaning you're going to continue to infect the same number of people um, over time. But what I could say about that is that, I mean, to date, when they found mutations, they didn't seem to have a significant effect on, on, on the virus um, in terms of, of, I mean, there's some rumors that perhaps, perhaps not, but it does seem to... Um, to really not shift very much over time, and at least this far it hasn't. Now the thing is with mutation is the less um, transmission there is, the less mutations, the less chance there is for a mutation to emerge. So keeping that curve flattened uh, is not only an advantage in terms of uh, having less people affected by the illness, but also in terms of um, making sure that the virus has less chances to to then mutate and and maybe become something worse or better. But you have to understand a lot of people think that a virus when it mutates, uh, it goes into a place that's uh, more beneficial for the virus. Now that's usually true. That's what the selection uh, bias is. But don't forget, there's kind of two selection. There's a selection of what's best for the virus when it's inside you, um, and what's best for the virus, um, what makes it easier for it to transmit to another person. And so it's hard to really figure out 
where the virus might optimize the most, what's the bottleneck, um, and whether that, that would leave us with a more severe virus or a less severe virus. So, so we might be hoping for the best, actually, and uh, maybe if, if it does uh, drift or, or shift, that it, it's going to be a beneficial for all of us. Um, and hopefully it doesn't shift too much and the vaccine becomes useless. So that's, that's the other hope, because that's what happens with influenza. Cool. I'm just, uh, Melvin has a question. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to turn him on here. And uh, you can unmute your mic, Melvin. You're there. All you're right. Uh, pick me up. Oh, okay. So uh, you mentioned a while ago that the, the virus, or at least the major strain, seems to have a very high degradation rate, a very high failure rate. I, I, am I understanding that correctly? No, not quite. Um, okay. they, I mean, so for influenza, for example, I think it's got a half-life of about, uh, on average, it'll take about 10 hours to degrade. Um, okay. and, and that's on average, right? So it's an exponential decay. And so you might have 10% of the virus that degrade only in like one hour. Uh, and and after after 10 hours, maybe you've lost, so you've lost about 50% of your virus. And by maybe 20 hours, you've lost 90% of your mm -hmm. virus and so on and so forth. Um, and it depends, that's, that's different for all viruses. And so the whole idea of, of studying this COVID-19, how long can, do, does my groceries have to sit there before uh, I can touch them safely? Uh, those questions are answered by doing experiments that allow us to see that, that rate of decay. I see, I see. Uh, so yeah, I, actually I asked that question, um, like basis for my next question. Uh, this might be more of a virology question than a uh, virophysics question, but uh, does a high degradation rate, you know, a high uh, a high failure rate among the uh, reproductions, does that somehow connect to its, to how to say, the mutability of the virus, the likeliness of it being, uh, how to say, unstable or capable of changing to circumstance? Well, it's a very interesting question because uh, it, it, I mean, it, it depends on all viruses. So, so being a physicist, when I entered the, the field of virology, um, I kind of thought, you know, if I can develop a model for viruses, I'm done, right? And it turns out, of course, uh, you need a virus for every single type of model or a, a model for every single type of virus, or, mm. or at least you need classes of viruses. And in particular, mm. so for example, for influenza, um, the degradation rate is very poorly correlated with the strain severity or anything mm. you can mutate i mean i've looked at a lot of different mutations and strains of influenza and i found that mostly the decay is much more set by environmental conditions than by the strain so uh, whether it's warm or cold whether the environment is humid uh or very dry um so that those kind of factors have a lot of impact on the stability of the flu virus but not the various strains of flu that you get every year um, you can look at all of them and they tend to have roughly the same clearance rate so it's not linked but for a virus, for example, for like a respiratory syncytial virus, so RSV that I was talking about earlier, um, it does seem that the, the, the rate, the, because of the way in which it decays, it has something to do with um, the, the configuration of its, of its protein as, as the virus makes its way out. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. pre-trigger and a post-trigger state. Um, mm -hmm. And when the virus is in its pre-trigger state, it's very infectious, meaning it's got a very infective arm and it can attach to cells more easily. Uh, so you can imagine that there would be a virus mutation that allows the state to be more stable uh, or, or makes it less stable so that the virus flips out um, and becomes much less infectious. And, and that state is not revertible. You can't go back to the state. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a situation where a mutation might allow the virus to be more stable. Um, so, so it really depends on each virus. And, and I don't know for, for COVID-19 uh, how relevant that might be. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're muted, Andrew. <laughs> so I was typing. Um, so I couldn't, yes, uh, we're running a bit over time, but, uh, yeah. I think there's the immediacy to this. If you don't mind taking uh, a couple more questions, I've been encouraged to allow you to do that. Um, if you're not getting too hoarse, Kathleen. No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, also, I mean, I could put a, a, a like YouTube, uh, like, sorry, a zoom URL and I could continue that on a separate zoom if that's desirable. You could, or you could turn off the live YouTube and let people, um, I, up to you. Let's take, let's take it. Let's take a couple more. Um, yeah. So I just want to scroll up because someone asked a question really early on that I had a, um, someone asked, uh, Max asked, do you use machine learning to create a predictive model for COVID-19? I do not. Um, I use something called Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the, the mathematical models you've seen, and then in terms of estimating what the parameters might be, I use a method called Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, 
where, where the likelihood of accepting a particular set of parameters um, is dependent on, um, well, so it's, it's from Bayesian inference, so it depends on my prior assumptions about the parameters, which hopefully it does not, because if your data is informative, then your priors don't matter. What you assumed about your parameters doesn't matter. Um, so so that's, that's basically what I use. I have some assumptions about the parameters. Uh, I have some likelihood of, of those parameters being the right one given the data, and you just iterate that over and over again until it kind of converges to, to a, a finalized distribution. And so that's the result you saw, those error bars, the, the wide band represent the uncertainty in, in the parameters. Okay. Um, so uh, another question, uh, someone, uh, Crystal is asking about uh, immunity passports. Um, yes. Crystal, you could have just turned on your mic and ask this, you're a panelist. Anyway, um, uh, some governments want to give immune people passports to engage in activities. Are they consulting with modelers on this? What is your opinion about this? Well, I, I, they're not consulting with me is all I could say. <laughs> um, what my opinion on this is, I mean, you heard how kind of careful I was to suggest that you could have long lasting immunity. I mean, people don't even know if you form any sort of immunity. Now, I would find that very surprising. Um, again, I said if I had to put my money on something, I'd say that at least a year, I would imagine you'd be you'd be protected. Um, but again, the issue is, can we determine if if you're if you're protected and by how much? So, for example, if you've been infected um, and you got better, um, and we do the antibody test and we find, oh yeah, you've got the antibodies for the virus, and we let you out there. Here are some of the things that could happen. Number one, I told you that I think those people who are reinfected are actually people who never got over it fully. So maybe we leave you out there and two months from now, we give you this immunity passport and, and, and a month from now or two months from now, you have another viral blip because you never fully cleared the virus. It's still in there. And you have another viral blip where you can infect other people. And now it might be worse. You might be completely asymptomatic by then. Um, and you wouldn't even know to self-isolate. So that's one way. We don't understand enough about whether this virus fully resolves and when it fully resolves to really do that. Having you know a whole week of negative tests doesn't mean you're, you're through it necessarily. Uh, the other problem is, do you know that your antibody tests are working? So it's not because you have antibody against the virus um, that these are protective. I mean, that's the whole point of these vaccines. We have vaccines, we know they respond to the virus. You do trials because you know that once you put in the person, uh, they might get lots of these antibodies, but they might not actually protect them against the virus. And so so, so that's some of the issues that I could see with, with that passport. We, it's not a bad idea per se, um, but I don't think our knowledge is there to actually support something like that and to be able to rely on it, number one. And number two, the other problem that people have pointed out with the passport is that people might want the chance to be able to rejoin society. And so people might be uh, excited about getting themselves infected for the purpose of being able to get that passport and be able to circulate again. So it would put a lot of people at risk then um, if that were to happen. Oh, so these kind of, are some of the concerns. Yeah, well, it's not just so, it, you make it sound like it's just a social incentive. It, it's potentially like a monetary in incentive for some Oh, people. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's an unequal monetary incentive. Um, yes, because there are people who are far more desperate to, to need to get back to work uh, than others. So it's, yeah, it's a real issue. And I mean, this virus, I mean, like anything else in society, predominantly affects um, people that are not wealthy, right? So it's, it's, it's a far bigger problem. The poor you are, the hor most horrible the, this virus is for you. So, um, I have a question from uh, Sones. What are your thoughts on the number of tests administered in Japan? For for example, they have like a certain amount, X amount of tests, but only yeah. a small percentage of those are actually administered. And how is that yeah. affecting the, how is that affecting the data, data you're working with, I guess is what she's asking. How's yeah. it affecting the Japan curve outcomes? And um, what is our, I, what, she asked, what is the potential after the state of emergency is lifted? Right. So, so what I would say is, of course, we'd like more data, better data. What I would say has been extraordinary is the fact that all this data is available for free publicly, that you can go and get data from almost anywhere. Anyone can. So I'm not, you know, one of the government modeler. I'm just a person in my living room, as you can see with my cat here, brown, brown. Um, and so that's been nice that everybody gets a say and everybody gets a try. And in particular, um, so, so that's been appreciated. Now, the data, yes, I'm concerned about the number of cases, and it's not very clear whether, for example, the detection efficiency is what we call it, uh, is constant over time. So in other words, we know that when there's more tests, uh, we get more positive tests. And when there's fewer tests, 
done, we get fewer positive tests. Um, and so it's not like the purport, the number of, of positive tests stay the same while the number of tests, uh, sorry, the number of, of confirmed stays the same while the number of tests fluctuates. You actually see that when you test more, you get more. Now you might say, well, that's very concerning because it suggests that the more you test, the more people you get, how many people are you missing? But one possibility is that um, people, more people get tested or more tests are done when there's more people showing up at hospitals. And so it's possible that, that these fluctuation in the number of positive and number of tests have a little bit, or, or at least as partly correlated with uh, how many people are, are really uh, infected. The other thing is, I mean, our model is able to, to some extent, at least put a lower bound on, on how, what could be the detection efficiency. So for example, for Saitama, I think my lower bound, I'd have to look this up, but I think maybe is around 20%. So, so we know that they're detecting more than 20% of the cases, right? And I'm, I'm saying that very hand wavy. Really. Uh, I'd have to really look at, at the data more carefully. But, but basically, yeah, we, we can guesstimate at least the, the lower bound of these things. And so, so and, 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 and the bar, the, the uncertainty in my predictions reflect that, that lack of, of full, full, full knowledge. So remember I said anywhere between 1,000 and, and 20,000 people have been affected by the virus. That huge range of 1,000 to 20,000 that comes from, from that uncertainty in, in whether the, the, the tests are representative of the overall population. Okay, did that, um, Sonas, you had a second part um, about the antibody test, but I think Kathleen answered that earlier. Did, did she cover what you wanted to know? Um, I'm not sure I can wait for the answer though. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, okay, yes. yes. Okay, yes. super, um, actually, I. I think we hit, did I miss one, anyone? Did I did I miss a question here? The cat? Brown the, the Brown, he's Brown Brown the cat. Um, I think, I don't think I scrolled past one, so I think we're good. Um, oh, hold on, just wait. Uh, yeah, I saw Nessa just mentioning that she, uh, she was symptomatic, but she was refused testing. Repeatedly, this is a common story. I don't know, Kathleen, if you've been following it, but this is the kind of a repetitive story in Japan that you have to. There's quite a high bar before they'll even test you. Um, in Canada as well. So this is a different thing because that person said that they refused to be tested, as opposed to were. Oh, I don't know. So, Sonas, do you mean that you chose to not be tested, or they refused to let you test? Because I think the. It's more common for people to want the test and not be able to access it. And I can understand how stressful that is. Um, they refuse to test me, right, yeah. So, so that's common here as well. So it used to be that the criteria for Canada was that you have to have severe symptoms. And then the, now they're relaxing that to you have to have symptoms at all. I think perhaps in Ontario, you'd be likely to be tested at this time, but it varies a lot. In Japan, that's still a big problem. I understand that if you go to private labs, I think you're more likely to be able to get tested. Um, what I would say to you is if you think you've been infected, I hope you're okay now. I hope you're not experiencing uh, symptoms. If you are, I would imagine they will admit you right away. Um, if, you're, if you're not too severe, um, what I would say is, um, I mean, wait this out indoors because as I mentioned earlier, you might still be infectious. You might be feeling fine, but you might uh, get, you know, respurts in, in the future. Now, I don't expect these will be associated with significant uh, symptoms, um, but uh, they might be. Um, and, and especially in between, you might actually infect people. So, so 30 days is good if there's other people around you, uh, if they can help doing the groceries. Now, mind you, they've probably been exposed now, too. Um, but um, yes, consider yourself maybe possibly through this. Uh, but be careful that you might still be a vector for others. So now you have to worry about what risk you, you pose to others more so than anything else. Now, I know you'd like to know the answer to your question, was that actually COVID-19 I got? Uh, and in fact, the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. Um, if, if you're curious about that, I would expect that the antibody test will eventually become more widely available. How reliable they'll be, I don't know, but that's when your chance will come. They'll be cheaper, you'll be able to do them at home, and at least that might give you some confidence. And in fact, you know, if, if you're not too tight for money, uh, they sell them online. Uh, you could buy a bunch and try the different ones and see how that plays out for you. Um, and you know, take it all with a grain of salt um, because there's various qualities out there. Okay, and uh, someone just snuck a question in under the wire here. Um, I don't think I'm going to, I'll read it to you, but I don't think I'm going to let you answer it because I think it leads into um, 
it leads into the 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 box of worms you hinted about in terms of vaccine. Uh, right. So this guy. This, but I think I've got an important message I want to say about oh, that. Oh, okay. So I see the All right. Yeah, so I see okay. the question for how, how, how soon do you think we can get a vaccine or a cure and are there different strains of the virus now around the globe? So I'll, I'll take the first one because I've kind of talked about the, the strains. We don't think there's significant uh, mutation at this point that we have to worry about now. There's a vaccine. I want to remind you that it's now 2020 as uh, we have trouble forgetting these days um, and, and we still do not have a vaccine for HIV. And, and that's a very important thing to point out. Uh, basically since the 1980s, we've been hunting for a vaccine for HIV. Now we have good antiviral drugs, uh, but we don't have a vaccine. So there are different tricks people use to create vaccines and they're usually all the same trick. We've got our box of tricks and we just run through all of them and hope for the best. Um, there's tweaks, of course, I'm simplifying a little bit, but if those work out, we luck out and sometimes they don't and we might not ever develop a vaccine. So the idea that it's just a matter of time that we'll eventually get one, um, that's certainly not been true for HIV but we did get antiviral drugs, right? And so the antiviral drugs, if I had to guess, I would think we're more likely to develop some sort of antiviral. And I say develop, a lot of the work that's being done right now is called repurposing. You take an old antiviral drug that worked against something and you see if it works for this, right? So you take him off the wall. Now it's slightly more sophisticated than that. You can do fancy molecular simulation to see what drugs will bind better and what, what, what things on the virus you'd wanna bind. But ultimately it's kind of a spaghetti, throw spaghetti against the wall and see if it sticks. And we might get lucky. Um, it's unlikely I think that we'll get uh, the type of antiviral that would give you prophylaxis protection, meaning you can take it continuously and are protected against catching the virus. That's, I mean, for one thing, not realistic. We'd have to keep taking them well, <laughs> perpetually. Um, and then the, 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 the thing I would think is more likely is maybe reduce the severity of the symptoms you get or uh, reduce your likelihood of dying, right? And if we could get something that works at all in this, like even if it just is effective at, at 80%, like maybe if it just, no, sorry, 20% effective, that's still 20% uh, of people uh, spared, right? And so even now the problem is oftentimes the, if that's, if it's not that effective, it might not pass the the test, right? They might not get to market. But for me, I think even a reduction in mortality of 20% would be totally worth it, right? So can we get an antiviral? It's not perfect, it doesn't work great, but it works well enough to at least reduce the death rate. And in particular, if it only reduces the death rate and not the transmission rate, it's less likely that the virus would have any motivation um, to mutate around it because it's only affecting people who are not transmitting anymore. They're already in hospital. Um, and so let's hope that that, that that could be, I think this is the most realistic hope we can have is an antiviral that make this less, the, the virus less less lethal. And, and so at least we could let, as we let the virus maybe burn through the population in a controlled way, uh, we'll lose fewer people along the way. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, thanks. Uh, so uh, I was just about to do thanks to all the speakers and blah, 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 because I'm so used to doing that. But uh, Raymond, I don't want to step on your toes here. Do you want to? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I'm happy for you to take the reins. I do want to have all the, uh, you know, the the speakers that are still on chat and some of, and the uh, organizers to turn on their video. I want to take a screenshot of what we have. Maybe ha if you have a drink, grab a drink. Um, actually, I'll finish with this Not one. Not anymore. Ah, <laughs> uh, for me, so I don't have a drink. Uh, well, you, if you, oh, your cat's asleep. It looks like so. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll enjoy enjoy with the cat then. Um, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say thank you, but I think um, you know I'm happy, Andrew, you can uh, please go ahead and uh, close us out, please, if you will, while I uh, take some photos of this uh, wonderful <laughs> session. Oh okay, I won't I won't throw up the I won't throw up my slide then. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I was just gonna say thank you, thank you to, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the speakers, thank you to the the other panel.